Real quick, before we get started, if you guys need a recap to Season 1, just hit the little tab that opened up in the upper right-hand corner. That'll take you to the recap. Now, with the events that took place at the end of Season 1, the downfall was substantial. Alex ended up walking away from the morning show and just living in Maine. She hadn't talked to Bradley since that day. Chip went to go work for a new station, WVXT. He's got a new girlfriend, and he's planning on proposing on New Year's Eve. Which, I'll tell you right now, she says yes. They always do. Claire also left the show. After finding one of her best friends dead, she decided it wasn't for her. She's currently studying for her GRE. And then there's Corey. Now, Corey was initially fired, with Fred being put on administrative leave. It was something that Corey could not believe, but while the board thought Fred was guilty, they couldn't prove it. What they could prove was the fact that Corey came in and their show kind of went to hell in a handbasket, so they let him go. But he was actually brought back after Bradley threw a conniption fit. So the show picks up eight months after the end of season one. It's New Year's Eve. They've replaced Alex with another anchor named Eric. But while they prepare for their big New Year's show, which will be hosted by Eric and Bradley, the big story that everybody's talking about is the fact that their nighttime anchor, Ray Marcus, has been accused of emotional abuse. So they're going to have to replace Ray. He's been on, quote, vacation, so it's not like UBA didn't know about this. But now that the story's out, it's a pretty big deal. On top of it, Maggie Brenner is writing a book, and it's about everything that's happened in the news industry, and this could possibly be another chapter in it. So Corey ends up getting a team with legal together, along with Mia Jordan, and a new UBA employee named Stella, who seems like she's one step above Mia Jordan. The plan that they have right now is to put Eric on evening news. Now the issue is, who do they pair with Bradley? And their short list is down to two people because the third person they had in mind doesn't want to work with Bradley. Which brings up the elephant in the room, is Bradley cutting it? Her contract is up in a couple months, and ratings are down for the show. Mia poses the question of keeping Eric on the morning show and putting Bradley at nighttime. Mainly because she has this thirst to do actual news stories where a morning show is more puff pieces. Some of the people in the room actually laugh at this idea, because the fact is, Bradley has been kind of a loose cannon, uncoachable. Mia says, I love Bradley, but she needs the polish of a seasoned anchor like Alex to balance her out. And that's when Corey gets the bright idea, well then we'll just get Alex back. But that's going to be easier said than done, because no one's talked to Alex in eight months, and the last time UBA heard from Alex, it was a stern, no, I'm not coming back. And then you've got people like Stella who think that Alex is just flat out cooked. But the fact remains, if Corey wants Alex, he's got his work cut out for him. After his meeting with Mia and Stella and Legal, Corey heads on to focus on the new streaming service they've launched, UBA+. Plus. He's trying to get rights for shows and rights for movies, and it's stressful. But his quest for content gets interrupted when Bradley walks in uninvited. And like a good exec, Corey acts like he is thrilled to see her. And she's shown up to hint at the fact that she would be interested in the nighttime chair. At this point, Bradley feels like she's done her part. She's done a lot of the puff pieces they wanted her to. She even dyed her hair. And Corey kind of owes her one because he'd be out of a job if it wasn't for her going to bat for him. But Corey gives her a lot of fluff. But ultimately, he tells her, I can't move you. Bradley accepts it and even starts to talk herself into staying on the morning show because she feels like her and Eric really complement each other. She feels like her and Eric are a better match than her and Alex. But Corey tells her, well, you and Alex had a good thing there for a little bit. And who knows what would have happened if he kept it going. And Bradley has to admit, yeah, that's true. After Bradley leaves his office, now it's time to find her a partner. And he heads up to Maine, where Alex is very surprised to see him. She's been busy writing a memoir. A memoir that hasn't really got a lot of traction because she won't talk about the Mitch situation. And her agent reminds her, this is why people are going to buy books, because of the Mitch situation. So you need to write about it. But she's hesitant to. She's definitely very surprised, though, when Corey pulls up in his car. And he doesn't sugarcoat it. He just comes right out and says, I need you to come back for a year. Bradley's doing okay, but she's not testing great. Ratings haven't been good. And we're taking Eric for the evening news. Alex asks him, is Bradley upset? And Corey says, well, she will be. And Alex is totally turned off by the fact that they haven't even told Bradley yet. He tries to get the conversation, though, back on track, saying that it wouldn't be like before. It would be a whole new deal. Alex will be a big voice in the rebranding of UBA. He tells her, you were all we ever needed and we were too stupid to realize it, so please come back. But she says no. While she agrees with everything that he said, she feels like if she comes back, it'll look a little wishy-washy. And he says no. When your new deal gets announced, you're going to look like a genius. She still, though, says no. 
He makes one last-ditch effort before he leaves, telling her, just think about it for 24 hours, but it seems like her mind is pretty made up that she doesn't want to come back to UVA. So with Alex saying no, Corey heads back to the UBA office where he meets with Stella, and now they have to go to their plan C or plan D at this point. The next in line is an anchor named Aaron, and Corey tells Stella, just hold off on closing any kind of deal with him. Stella thinks it's because Corey hasn't told Bradley, and that's part of it, but it more so has to do with the fact Corey hasn't given up on Alex. He told her to wait 24 hours, and it definitely has not been 24 hours. And while Corey was busy trying to lure Alex back, Mia was busy putting together the the end-of-the-year montage for 2019. And it's very ironic because she says, man, this year sucked. She has no idea what's waiting for her in 2020. They do agree, though, that they should probably put themselves in the news, but more so with Alex and Bradley's rogue segment than anything else. She ends up running into Bradley when she's doing this, and Bradley thanks her, because Bradley knows she can be difficult, and it hasn't always been easy working with her, but Mia's always been there, standing by her, having her back, so she decides to thank her for that. Bradley has to get ready, though, because that night is the big ball drop. As she's hosting with Eric, Corey is stuck in traffic trying to get to the set. While he's doing so, Stella texts him that they're close to closing the deal with Aaron, and he's excited to work with Bradley. But Corey texts her back, just give me an hour. He calls Alex, but he gets her voicemail, so he decides to leave her this 11th hour plea to come back and work with UBA. Back over actually on set, though, Bradley's having the time of her life, but something has been eating Eric up. It's the fact that he's leaving and Bradley doesn't know. He knows he's not supposed to tell her, but he can't hold it from her anymore. He finally comes clean. Bradley, I'm going to the evening news. And Bradley can't believe that it seems like everybody else knew about it except her. She looks like a fool. So she's pretty pissed off. And unfortunately for Corey, when he arrives, he's the first person she sees. She screams at him, you lied to me. You put Eric in the nightly news and apparently everybody knows about it except me. He starts telling her how she needs to trust him because he has her best interest in mind. But she starts screaming back at him. And finally, he kind of has a little bit of a mini breakdown by saying, you know what? This job is hard. I know it doesn't seem like it to you because every time you come into my office, I have a Cheshire Cat grin on my face. But it's an act because when I took over, they didn't give me a Maybach. They gave me a rack with holes in it. And it's my job to fix it. So I'm trying to conjure Noah's Ark out of thin air. And honestly, I think I'm doing a pretty good job of it. And honestly, I had hopes that me and you would walk onto that arc together. She kind of looks at him cross-eyed and says, Is this the part where I'm supposed to thank you for giving me my big break? Because I'll remind you, you only have this job because of me. And Corey kind of takes this in and says, Man, you are so certain you know how the world works. It's amazing. You seem to think that your friends, and I'm counting myself in this, but your friends are out to get you. She corrects him, though, saying, we are not friends, because all you had to do to be my friend was be honest to me. Turns out, though, you're just a weasel that everybody said you were. And that's when Corey gets real serious and poses the question, did it ever occur to you that I can't tell you everything because you're obsessed with telling the truth, and I don't know what's going to leak out? And I also can't tell you how other people feel about you because your ego is too fragile where you go running off and crying. You never seem to process that information into something constructive. This ends with Bradley telling him to go fuck himself and storming off to go watch the ball drop. But back up in Maine, Alex went to a neighbor's New Year's Eve party, and as she was leaving, she saw that she had a missed call from Corey. When she listens to it, she hears that 11th hour plea from him. Corey decided to go with the poetry tactic. And it works. As Bradley and Eric are counting down the ball to being dropped to 2020, Alex ends up calling Corey back. Corey tells her, we want to be in the Alex Levy business no matter what. Look, our deal fell through with Eric's replacement. We're in a bind. You've done the morning show and you graduated and you've earned the right to move on. Could you please come back and fill in until you're ready to launch your new primetime show. And Alex is crying and tells Corey, listen, let's talk tomorrow. And Corey excitedly says, Alex, I will call you tomorrow. You will not be sorry, Alex. The last question that she asks him is, Corey, can I trust you? And he says, yes. And at that moment, it's 2020, which you feel bad for him because you know what they're walking into. As soon as he gets off the phone with Alex, he calls Stella and says, Kill the deal with Aaron. I'll explain everything tomorrow, but kill it. It's a new year, Stella. Things are looking up. But it doesn't even take one second for that statement to become a freezing cold take. Because as Corey looks up on the ticker in Times Square, he sees that Hannah's family has filed a wrongful death suit against UBA. And that is yet another issue that he's going to have to deal with.
Episode 2 picks up right where episode 1 left off, after the New Year's Eve broadcast. Bradley starts walking to her hotel room, but waiting for her in the lobby is Corey, and she wants to breeze right by him, but he says, no, I have to tell you something. You're already mad enough, and this is going to get out, so I'll tell you now face to face. We're bringing Alex back. We're going to get a deal done quickly, and we're going to hammer it out and get her on air as soon as possible. And Bradley doesn't say anything. She only gets pissed off at Corey when he says everything's going to work out, because she starts ripping him for being her boss and not her friend, because she actually thought he was a friend. And right before she gets in the elevator, she tells him, you know, I'm not feeling so well after being outside all day. I think I'm going to call in sick. And three weeks later, she's done that. She's called out sick for three straight weeks. But Bradley is the least of Corey's problems. Even three weeks later, he's got this wrongful death suit to deal with. And as he's talking to legal about what to do, they're proposing that they just hammer this out in court, drag it out, scare Hannah's parents. But Corey says, no, just give them what they want. We already have enough bad press as it is, so just pay them and end it. After legal leaves, he starts working on UBA+, Plus, but Stella walks in because, unannounced, Alex is showing up with her agent. She tried to sneak in covertly, but she does end up getting noticed. She just wants to see her new office, which, by the way, it's huge. Her agent is a little concerned, though. The deal isn't done, and he knows that UBA wants to do a big rollout when they announce this. They don't want this leaking out. So he reminds Alex, if anyone asks, you're just here seeing old coworkers, and that's it. So Alex and her agent are just chilling in this empty office when Corey and Stella walk in, and Corey goes full-on exec. I mean, you would have thought he just got laid. He is glowing, laying it on pretty thick. Stella, on the other hand, is pretty reserved. I mean, it's like yin and yang. Corey ends up mentioning how they can't wait to hear about Alex's ideas for her primetime show, but her agent tells them, well, we'll give you the full pitch once the deal is closed. When they bring up potential producers, he says the exact same thing. We'll discuss it when the deal is closed. One of the UBA employees runs in and interrupts all of them and says, Alex, you got to run down to the studio. But Stella says, don't. And Alex is a little taken aback, and Corey smooths it over by saying, Alex, you're one of the few good things going on for us right now. So we want to keep this under wraps until we tell the world that you're coming back. That's going to be good for you, it's going to be good for us, and it's going to be good for the show. Alex is okay with that, but she does question if her and Bradley should meet about this PR blitz. And Corey suggests that maybe she reach out to Bradley. Alex ends up asking if Bradley's excited, and Corey ends up lying and says she's so excited. As they're getting ready to leave, Corey suggests that maybe Alex and Stella get together at his place the next night just to hammer out some details. They all agree it sounds good, and Corey ends up leaving them back in the empty office. But right before Alex's agent leaves, she asks, did you get a chance to see an advanced copy of Maggie Brenner's book? And Alex's agent, Doug, tells her, no, they're keeping that pretty tight-lipped, but I wouldn't worry about it. You're going to look fine. And by the way, you have your own book, and if people want the story, they can get it from the horse's mouth. Alex then gets in the elevator to leave, but as she's doing so, she accidentally hits the floor to go to the studio just out of muscle memory. And curiosity gets the better of her, and she starts walking around a little bit, but she starts getting recognized, having a little bit of a panic attack. So she goes in her old dressing room, which just so happens to be Eric's dressing room at the moment. And she goes to leave once she sees that Eric is in there, but he says, no, I insist, stay. She congratulates him on getting nights, and he congratulates her on coming back. But she's a little surprised because nobody's supposed to know that. He then moves the conversation, though, to Bradley, saying, I guess you guys didn't end on the best note. And she says, well, did Bradley tell you that? And Eric says, no, it's just a feeling I got. Alex, though, tells him, no, we're good. And Eric starts poking around on how to get Bradley to talk to him again because Eric still being on the morning show is one of the many reasons why Bradley hasn't come back to work the last three weeks. He asks for some advice, but Alex tells him, I think you would know more. I mean, you've worked with her for, what, six months? He starts complaining about how it's really hard to be a good friend of her, and Alex just stands up and says, where do you get the right? I mean, me and Bradley worked together for three weeks and it was three difficult weeks and I'm sure she told you about that if you truly are friends but if you can't get a hold of her or get through to her after working with her for six months then maybe you're not friends maybe the problem here is you and then she leaves as she was leaving she did end up avoiding both Daniel and Mia and Mia just went to check on Daniel because he once again got passed over and not only did he get passed over but they're bringing in the woman who really screwed him over in the first place and Alex but then Daniel starts asking about the coronavirus because the first case in the U.S. just hit and he thinks that they should devote some time to it, but Mia reminds him it's kind of a depressing topic. There's always something going on, and there's a lot of news already that they have to pack into the show. Mia, though, then changes the subject to the dinner at Corey's. Even though Corey wanted it to be intimate, it's not. Pretty much every anchor's been invited at this point, and Daniel doesn't want to go, but he doesn't really have a choice. But Bradley is still holding out, just sitting in a hotel room. She's going out once to get ice cream, but that's it. 
She needs some suggestion on how to get through to Alex. So she calls the one person that knows Alex better than anybody, Chip. And when she tells Chip that Alex is coming back, he's really surprised. Bradley starts venting to him about the fact that it just feels like they're calling in Bradley's big sister to clean up her mess. And Chip tells her, you know that's not the actual case, right? UBA's been a dumpster fire for a while. But once again, Bradley's called to get some insight on who Alex is. And Chip tells her that Alex can make you feel like you were the most important thing in the world. And then you turn around and she'll push you right off a cliff. And she'll justify it to herself because deep down, Alex is in it for Alex. Alex is extremely competitive. And this is exactly how Chip feels. That Alex made him feel like he was the greatest thing in the world. But then when push came to shove, she pushed him off that cliff. And he vows that if he ever sees her again, he's going to have some choice words for her. She then hangs up the phone and needs to decide if she's going to this dinner tonight, which isn't very far for her to go. It's literally the floor up. Bradley's still on the fence about it. She had a pretty contentious conversation with her agents about going back to work, and she just seems to have stuck her foot in the ground and she's not moving. And one of the reasons why is she feels like she has a lot of leverage in this situation. UBA is about to roll out a big PR blitz with the return of Alex Jackson for Alex and Bradley. She is the Bradley. But her agent warns her, you might have leverage in this situation, but remember... If you squeeze, then the people that you're squeezing are going to remember that. And the first chance they get, they're going to squeeze back harder. But Bradley is really the only question mark that this dinner has. And that's when Corey gets a phone call from Sybil, who's his boss. And she is enraged because Bradley was photographed by page six going out and getting ice cream. And she doesn't look sick at all. She's making UBA look foolish. And Sybil commands Corey to fire her immediately. And Corey doesn't really have a choice. So he just, to get her off the phone, says... Okay, but he's not ready to give up on the Bradley train just yet. He heads downstairs to ask her, are you coming up to this thing? She doesn't really answer them, though, when he asks that question, and he gets tough with her, saying, okay, well, if you are coming, then you need to put your big girl pants on. I know you think you're sticking it to everybody, but in reality, you're only sticking it to yourself. And I know you don't believe this, but I went through a lot of trouble to get Alex back for you, because if you could actually just get the anger out of your way, you'd realize that Alex coming back is good for the show, good for her. More importantly, it's good for you. Because it's going to be incredibly successful. It's going to give you the green light to do all the things you've ever wanted to do, including serious news stories. So, trust me, if you don't make this work for you, you're only screwing yourself. And she comes back with a snarky response, and he just shakes his head and leaves. Because you can lead a horse to water, but you can't force it to drink. But a little while later, to Corey's surprise, Bradley shows up. Bradley and Alex have a super long, super awkward hug. But then they split up. Bradley starts talking to Mia about her, quote, sickness. And Alex goes to talk to Daniel because Daniel was really the only person in the room who was cold to her when she showed up, and Alex knows why. Alex tries to apologize, saying she's a different person now, but the damage is done as far as Daniel's concerned. He tells her, I turned down co-anchor at YDA because we made an agreement. And even though Alex didn't know that, the very next morning, Alex decided to go on an impromptu crusade with the woman that she was supposed to be firing. And while Daniel's glad that Alex said what she said about Fred, he's pissed off because he didn't want to be the collateral damage because of it. Alex realizes that she really hurt Daniel and tells him, anything I can do to help you move forward, I will do it. You deserve a lot better than you've gotten. But I can't turn back time. All I can promise that I can do is better. But Daniel says, apology not accepted and walks off. Good news for Alex, though. She doesn't have to sit next to him at dinner. Bad news is... She has to sit next to Bradley. Since they do work at a news station, news conversations start popping up. Most people are downplaying the coronavirus, just saying, and this is going to shock you out there, quote, it's nothing worse than the flu. Daniel, though, keeps saying, I don't think we should joke about this. I mean, people are really getting sick, and someone should cover it. Alex, who is trying to be better, says, well, then let's get you on a plane. But Daniel was planning on going to Iowa for the caucus, and Alex volunteers Bradley to do it because of the fact that she likes serious news stories. But Bradley somehow gets offended by the fact that Alex volunteered her to do something that she would actually want to do. Daniel, though, gets the conversation back on track by saying, I'm not saying that I need to cover coronavirus. I'm saying that we as a station need to start covering the coronavirus. And Stella reminds everybody that a disease spreading isn't exactly compelling TV. Boy, will she be wrong in a few months. And then leave it to the weatherman who comes in hot like a heat wave. We just need to get this sham of an impeachment trial over. Corey can kind of tell that he probably should break this up before there's an all-out brawl, so he makes a toast to the return of Alex and the return of Alex and Bradley, laying out their entire PR blitz, which is a lot. After dinner, though, Alex feels like Bradley's being a little standoffish. So she walks up to her and asks her, is everything okay? And Bradley tells her yes, but it's not believable. And when Alex suggests that they get together, Bradley says, yeah, contact my assistant. 
So there's two people that Alex is going to need to mend some fences with. She ends up heading out, but as she's walking to the elevator, Bradley chases after her. And the two women have it out right there in the hallway. Bradley telling Alex that since she's been gone, things have changed and things are going to be different on this new show. She's not going to be her little sister anymore. She's going to be her equal and her partner. But really, the basis of this argument has to do with the fact that Bradley feels hurt by the fact that Alex didn't really reach out to her after she left the show. She called her, but it was a week after she told the network she wasn't coming back. And since then, she hasn't talked to her at all. Bradley screams at Alex, everybody in that room is out for themselves, so I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to compete with you for the best stories. And Alex yells back, do it. That's what you should do. Don't roll over. You should never roll over. That's literally the job. Just do the job. Sorry I didn't call you. We worked together for a month. We don't owe each other a thing. But then Bradley asks, what about Chip? Do you owe him anything? Because I talked to him and he said he hasn't heard from you either. And how long did you work together? 15 years? Sounds like a great thing to have a friendship with you, but congratulations on your mega deal, Alex. But a few days later, Alex realizes that Bradley is right, so she goes to pay Chip a visit. And even though Chip talked really tough on the phone saying, if I ever see her again, I'm going to have some choice words, he does it. And when Alex asks him to come back and be her producer, he says, when do I start? Life at UBA, though, starts to go back to normal. Bradley goes back to work putting on a good face with Eric. They even send Daniel to Wuhan. And then there's the matter of Hannah's settlement. Corey had told Legal, get it done, but he gets a phone call saying, we can't. They won't settle. Their number is astronomical. They're clearly trying to send a message. They want $119.2 million. And Corey knows exactly what that number is. It's the number that they paid Fred Micklin to walk away. And speaking of Fred, He's been trying to get in touch with Mitch Kessler, who is just flying under the radar living in a chateau in Italy. Mitch, though, keeps sending his call straight to voicemail, and eventually Fred actually shows up, but Mitch slams the door in his face. And Mitch has done a pretty good job of flying under the radar, although one day, as he's just sitting in a square eating gelato, a 21st century liberal crusader, and I can say that because I'm a liberal soy boy, walks up to him and starts screaming at him in the middle of the square saying, oh, He doesn't have the right to be there. He's ruining her gelato. He's ruining her vacation. And Mitch is taking it in, but asking her to keep her voice down. Gets to the point where everyone's head is turned watching this go down. And one local walks over to her and says, you need to stop. And the crusader says, if you have any idea what this man did, and the local cuts him off and says, you mean like if I knew that this man was Mitch Kessler? He's just sitting here eating his gelato. I didn't see him come and try to grab you. Why are you kicking him when he's down? I think this is more about you. And that's when the local notices that, yeah, it is, because her best friend is filming this interaction, and she can't wait to post it to social media. The local ends up scaring the liberal crusader back to her avocado toast. And Mitch, who is mortified, ends up sneaking out, walking away, not wanting any more unwanted attention his way. But the local ends up chasing after him. She ends up introducing herself. Her name is Paula, and she's kind of in the media, but not really. But she did it to pick Mitch's brain. So he reluctantly gives her a number, and they agree to meet up later so she can do that. Corey and the creative team at UBA start working on the rollout for Alex's return. They ever go into a screening room and watch a commercial, but then the conversation goes to an interview she's doing with one of their reporters named Laura Peterson. There's currently scheduling issues. Laura wants two days. And Alex says to the group, Laura Peterson's a professional. She doesn't need two days to follow me around. But let me explain. She needs two days because she wants to chronicle Alex leaving her quiet life and heading back to the morning show. Alex seems pretty stern, though. She can get all that in one afternoon. Alex then says goodbye to the group, but right before she leaves, she remembers to tell them about Chip. And they're all a little taken aback, but Corey tells Stella, get the deal done. Now that this little bomb has been dropped, Mia walks back into the newsroom, and right before they get into the stories they're going to do that day, she lets the group know that Chip is coming back. And it's split. Some of the group is thrilled, while others, not so much. They then go along with scheduling the next day's show. And that show does include a segment with Daniel who barely got out of Wuhan. He was on the last train. He's currently quarantining in Beijing, and he drops a word that we'll all get really used to, social distancing. And Bradley and Eric kind of make fun of him for it. You can tell they're not really taking his situation all that seriously. They then, though, wrap up with Daniel because they have to make the big announcement about Alex's return. And it's incredibly cheesy. Corey is pumped, but, you know, Stella, no, she doesn't really hide her emotions too well. She's not excited at all. Corey then goes to congratulate Bradley on just a job well done, but she tells him that she wants to moderate the debate in Vegas. 
He tells her, I appreciate that, but I'll defer to Stella on this one because Stella took over for Corey as the head of news. Corey took over for Fred, but Bradley can't believe that all of a sudden he's deciding to defer to Stella. She starts giving Corey a whole lot of attitude, telling Corey that he needs somebody who people know is an independent thinker. Alex Levy is always going to be thought of as the morning show, but moving forward, when people think of political coverage, she wants them to think about her. He reminds her, though, that Laura Peterson is going to interview her for Alex's return, and she's going to interview her at the Iowa caucus. So that is politics. Corey tries to switch topics, but Bradley says, I am going to moderate that debate. And he turns to her and says, Bradley, is your microphone on? And when she says no, he says, good, because I can't have you talking to me like this in a room full of my employees. Good show, though. And then he leaves. After the show that day, Bradley's going to have lunch with Alex. She feels kind of bad. They left on bad terms, and they are going to be reuniting. Alex starts telling Bradley that she's done a lot of soul searching in the last nine months, and she's changed, but Bradley doesn't really buy it. Alex, though, does apologize, and Bradley does seem to appreciate it. But the women's conversation gets interrupted when Maggie Brenner walks up. They exchange some quick pleasantries, but once Maggie leaves, Alex starts ripping her. And Bradley can't figure out why, because she thinks Maggie is just a nice person, and Alex thinks that's a pretty naive comment. Alex then asks Bradley if she talked to Maggie for her book, and Bradley says, yeah, I did, but I didn't say anything bad about you. She can tell that Alex thinks she was an idiot for talking to Maggie for her book, so she reminds Alex, I've been in this business for over 20 years. I'm not going to let some journalist wrangle me into a comment that I didn't mean to say. And Alex tells her, I understand you've been in this industry for a while, but you might not be used to the Maggie Brenners and the Laura Petersons of this world. And Bradley kind of gets upset because she feels like Alex is poisoning her brain about Laura Peterson before she even meets the woman. Alex, though, goes on to tell her that she's had a lot of run-ins with Laura. She doesn't particularly trust her. She didn't think Laura likes her, so that's why she's kind of got her back up. One of the things she wanted to accomplish here today was getting their facts straight. Bradley is pretty surprised by this, thinking that Alex sounds crazy, but Alex asks her, what are we going to say about our last day? How I was trying to get you fired, and I found out that you interviewed Mitch behind my back, and you interviewed Hannah the day she died? And do we really need people to know that I announced you as my co-anchor on a whim to get back at the network? Bradley gets Alex's point, so the two women start game planning on how to get their story straight. A couple of days later, Alex gets ready for her big interview with Laura. Alex is doing it at her apartment so she's more comfortable, and one of the many people that's going to be there is Chip. Although Chip is a little concerned because his deal isn't done yet. Chip is really there to kind of calm Alex down for moments like when Laura doesn't show up on time. And instead of Alex being the first one, her ego trip makes Laura wait when she finally does show up. Chip decides to leave Alex alone for a bit and walks out, and that's when he sees Mia and Corey and Stella. And Mia seems happy to see Chip. Corey, however, you know you never really can tell. He puts on the facade. But Stella does not hide her emotions. He then sees Laura walk in, so he goes to grab Alex. And while he's doing so, Corey goes and talks to Laura, asking her nicely to kind of prep Bradley a little bit when she's out in Iowa. Make her realize that reporting on things like sweatshops isn't really morning show material. She doesn't say yes, but she also doesn't say no. And then she gets ready to do the interview with Alex. Everybody who doesn't need to be there is told to get out. That actually includes Corey and Stella. So they head to the elevator, and Stella can't hold it in anymore. She tells Corey, I don't think it was a good idea to bring Chip back, and I wasn't going to say anything, but we need to talk to Alex. And Corey tells her, when we're not in a tailspin, you can do your loop-de-loops, but until then, you need Alex to land as much as I do. And Stella kind of takes offense to that and tells him, it's not like I don't want to approve stuff, it's because I actually care about this stuff. I want to build things, but it's tough to do when there's no foundation. And Corey says, I hear you. But in order to make those changes, you know what you need? You need success. So we need to keep Alex happy so she is successful. As they head home, Laura starts the interview. And it starts off with UBA's issues. But then Laura asks about Hannah. And that wasn't on the table. Alex actually says she was a pretty private person and I want to respect her privacy. And Laura doesn't press it. But she does go into Maggie Brenner's book. Maggie provided Laura with an excerpt from the book detailing the toxic environment that was at UBA. And Alex is getting visibly uncomfortable, but she handles it like a pro. She does, however, get pretty upset when Laura asks her, what was the nature of your relationship between you and Mitch Kessler? Implying that the two had slept together. Alex kind of thinks about it, is a little taken aback, but says he was my best friend. But Mitch could be a lot of things to many people, and I cut off contact with him. 
When the interview wraps up and everybody leaves, Alex is pissed, and she starts taking it out on Chip. She was totally taken off guard by that question. She feels like it was more of an accusation, and she can't believe that somebody from the own network would actually ask it. And the reason she's taking it out on Chip is because he's the one who approved the questions, but he makes it clear. The question I approve is more of, how was your relationship with Mitch? Not, what was the nature of your relationship? Chip tries to calm her down by telling her that he doesn't think the network should have used it anyway, and he thinks she's slightly overreacting to this whole situation. But now that Laura Peterson's done with Alex, she moves on to Bradley in the Iowa caucus. And right before Bradley's going to get on the plane with Laura, she gets a phone call from Alex. And Alex goes on to tell Bradley about the question that she got regarding Mitch. But she's telling her this because she was taken off guard and she just want Bradley to be taken off guard. Right before she hangs up the phone though, she does make it clear to Bradley, by the way, I did not sleep with Mitch. And then Bradley gets on the plane and meets Laura Peterson for the first time. When they get to Iowa, Bradley and Laura do the interview and Bradley shines. For Bradley, it kind of is a puff piece. But back in New York, Bradley's Iowa caucus stories are bumping Daniel and his update with the coronavirus. And after getting bumped yet again, Daniel ends up calling Mia because he's pissed. He says, you sent me across the world to the epicenter of an epidemic, and now I'm stuck in a hotel for 14 days quarantining, and now you're bumping me. Mia tries to explain, though, that they're in the middle of an impeachment, the Iowa caucus, and Kobe Bryant just died. So the stuff that he got bumped for is a pretty big deal. Daniel starts telling Mia on why an update on the coronavirus is important, and Mia starts telling him that she can hear TVs tuning out. Because at this point, and in the timeline, we're in early February, most Americans still aren't concerned with it. Now, while Mia is trying to calm down Daniel, Chip has made his return to UBA. And he finds that half the workers are thrilled and half the workers are not. And Rennett tells him that there are just some people that need some time to get over what happened. He then goes to look at the footage from the Laura Peterson interview, and he lets the editor know that he didn't approve the question, so he wants to tighten it up a little bit, because it does look pretty bad for Alex. Later that night, Bradley gives an update on the news about the Iowa caucus. They still don't have a winner. And as Alex is watching her report from home, she texts Bradley asking how it went with Laura. And Bradley doesn't get the text right away because she's just heading into her hotel room. As she's laughing with Laura about the fact that they don't have a result for the thing that they came out for, Laura lets her know that Corey wanted Laura to coach Bradley up. And the reason she's telling her this is because after seeing her in action, she doesn't feel like she needs to be coached up. And another reason she's telling her all this is because that she feels like Bradley is bigger than the morning show. She says to Bradley, the people that stay on the morning show can't really do anything else, but clearly Bradley can. Bradley is absolutely blushing. She's thrilled to get a compliment from such an accomplished woman. But Laura then asks about the relationship between her and Alex. And Bradley kind of laughs it off and doesn't answer the question. When she does end up getting back into her hotel room, she sees Alex's text message and she responds with, it went great. Alex, though, doesn't see it until the next day. When Bradley and Laura have gotten back into New York and they're driving over to the studio. And Alex responds and asks, so she didn't ask anything invasive? And of course, she did. She kind of did with the last question. But Bradley sees it and puts it to the side. And maybe one of the reasons is she's sitting right next to Laura. And she turns to Laura and says, do you think you got everything you needed for the interview? And Laura says, yeah. Honestly, I could have left yesterday, but I was having too much fun. She then gets a little bit closer to Bradley, though, and says, now that the cameras are off, now that I see how awesome you are... Do you mind if I ask you a personal follow-up question just between us? And Bradley says, yeah, of course. And Laura asks her, were you vetted for this job? And Bradley doesn't say a thing. But she leans in and starts making out with Laura. Maybe it was a deflection. Maybe it's because she was actually attracted to her. Laura is, after all, a lesbian. But it definitely is a topic changer. A couple days later, Daniel is able to leave Beijing. Eric ends up leaving the morning show. They say goodbye to him. Laura Peterson special airs, and because of Chip's editing ability, the question doesn't look that bad. And Corey ends up getting a call from Fred, but he ignores it. Because the next day, Alex Levy and Bradley Jackson are reuniting on the morning show. But the reason that Fred called is the same reason that he went all the way to Italy to visit Mitch. He finally gets Mitch to actually walk and talk with him. And the reason he showed up is because he wants to file a class action lawsuit against UBA. While Fred feels bad about what happened with Hannah, he takes no responsibility at all. Mitch, on the other hand, does feel guilty about what happened. He feels like Fred is being completely callous, and he wants nothing to do with a class action lawsuit. Fred keeps hammering home to Mitch that at the end of the day, they bear no legal responsibility, and they should not have to pay all of this money because, quote, some girl couldn't handle herself. But even with Fred's plea, Mitch has no interest in a class action. That night, he ends up meeting up with Paola. 
But they start going through Powell's career. She's a documentarian. She's kind of looking for like a regular steady job. And Mitch says, well, maybe I can pass off your stuff to somebody who can help. But Mitch's phone is blowing up. He doesn't want to get it, but Powell insists. And that's when, across the world, he ends up seeing the news that Alex Levy and Bradley Jackson are back together. And the reason his phone's blowing up is because people want him to comment on it. This upsets Mitch. So he says to Paola, I'm going to go. But Paola's curious as to why and grabs his phone. And that's when she sees the news. And she can't believe he's ready to just leave because of that. She tells him that that's your past. You have a chance to move on now. And Mitch says, I have moved on. But that is still a part of my life. And her advice to him is, you're never going to outrun the sadness, so grow some balls. The two start kind of arguing about Mitch's current situation a little bit. But Paula yells at him, you can still do good in the world, you can help people. Like, I want your help. I want you to do a documentary. There was an appeals court in Italy who overturned a rape conviction because the defendant said the victim was too ugly to rape. At this time, though, if Mitch is going to do a documentary, it's definitely not going to be about sexual abuse. So he stands up thanks her, pays the bill, and then leaves. But a few days go by, he reconsiders, and he messages Paola, if the offer still stands, I'd like to help you with that documentary. We'll start off episode four with Mitch. Mitch and Paola head to a local university so that Paola can interview a professor for that documentary she's working on. But as she heads inside, Mitch gets a phone call from his ex-wife Paige. And that's because the editor of the New York Daily News called Paige after someone tried to plant a pretty disparaging story about Hannah. Paige figures that it might be Mitch, but Mitch denies that he had anything to do with this. So as soon as he gets off the phone with Paige, he immediately calls Corey, who's in the middle of watching some programming that might or might not make it on UBA+. He tells Corey that someone's launched a smear campaign against Hannah, and immediately Corey knows that it was Fred. Mitch tells him that even though the New York Daily News won't run it, somebody will. They start getting into it about what exactly Corey's supposed to do about this. With Corey finding it very ironic that Mitch, the whole reason why this Hannah story is coming out, really, is the one who's calling him and telling him to do something about it. Mitch yells at him, you're the CEO. Do what the CEO does and handle it. Handle it, handle the suit, make it all go away. After a few hours, Paola comes out. Paola and Mitch head back to Paola's place, and she starts going over the footage of the interview with the professor, which went really well. The professor clearly admitted that there is problems in the Italian judicial system, with Paola bringing up the case of Amanda Knox. Paola ended up making both of them dinner, but she's not willing to serve Mitch. And as they're kind of laughing and joking around, Paola kisses him on the cheek, but Mitch says, don't do that. He is extremely uncomfortable. The next day, Mitch wakes up to a phone call from Paola, and she lets him know that the professor had contacted her because he had just tested positive for the coronavirus. And since Paola was with him, and she was with Mitch, really doing her civic duty by letting him know that he could have been exposed to this thing. But now they have to quarantine for 14 days. But she suggests that they quarantine together, work on this documentary, use the 14 days productively. So now Mitch has that to deal with. But back in the States, Alex's big return is a hit. Alex is the number one trending topic on Twitter. People are loving the fact she's back. But Alex gets pretty uncomfortable when they start bringing up terms like feminist god and modern day hero. She clearly doesn't see herself like that at all. The segment ends and Ty, the guy who's the social media wizard for the show, walks by Yanko and lets him know that someone retweeted his Groundhog Day video, but it's not in a good way. Yanko had the audacity to say that the groundhog was his spirit animal. And since it's 2021, or I guess in this case, it's still 2020, but still nothing's changed. People just wake up looking to be offended by something. And unfortunately for Yanko Flores, this is it. So Yanko is going to have to have a meeting later that day with Stella and Mia. Also, after the show, Alex and Bradley split up. They went their separate ways. Alex feels like a million bucks. Chip brings up the debate because they have to book the travel and all that. But Alex has no interest in moderating that debate. But Chip tells her that she really should reconsider. In the other dressing room, Bradley is quickly decompressing from the show. She's still hoping for moderator. But at the moment, she says she has a, quote, meeting to get to. One that was off the books that she scheduled for herself. This isn't a normal meeting. This is one of those bedroom meetings. And that meeting is with Laura. After they have some adult fun, Bradley needs to get going. She has to meet with Corey. And Bradley tells Laura that she's planning on walking into Corey's office and demanding moderator and not leaving until she gets it. And Laura can't believe that that's how the two talk. Because she's known Corey a long time and she knows that Corey wouldn't let just anybody talk to him like that. Bradley explains that it's complicated and Laura says, well, I'm all ears. So Bradley starts explaining the relationship between her and Corey. About how on Alex's last show... They fired Corey, they put Fred on leave, and they suspended Bradley. Because of this, her and Corey got really close. 
But a couple days later, when she got her opportunity to address the board, she unloaded on them. She told him that Fred needed to be fired and Corey was the guy to replace him. A day later, he came down to her room and he said that they made him CEO. The first move that he was doing is lifting her suspension. But now her attitude is, screw that guy. Laura then tells Bradley, you know they're talking about replacing him, right? UBA's in third, which wouldn't be a huge deal, but there's scandal surrounded by it. He's had a little bit of success for him, but people have a short memory. It comes down to money, and he's investing a lot of it in UBA+. Plus. And really, who wants another streaming service? At this point, UBA's balance sheet is a mess. So Laura suggests to Bradley that she talk to Corey, make amends with him. Even if it's just for show, at this moment, Corey is her CEO, the network is her partner. Making the network her ally and not her foe will help her career. So Bradley heads off with the idea that she'll meet with Corey at some point later that day. But back at UBA, Daniel wants to talk to Mia. Mia, though, doesn't really have a lot of time. She has to run to that meeting with Stella and Yanko. So she's not exactly all ears. But the reason that Daniel stopped her is because he wants to be the moderator. Daniel has noticed an unfavorable pattern for people of color at UBA. And he doesn't like it. He's coming to Mia because he figures that she also can commiserate with this. And with her current role, she can help. So all he's asking is that when she talks to Stella, she push for Daniel to moderate. Mia promises, yes, I will plead your case. And then she heads up to the meeting with Yanko, where they have to address the elephant in the room. I should say the spirit animal in the room. They tell Yanko that he's going to have to apologize on air because of it. And Yanko can't understand why. Honestly, he doesn't think he did anything wrong. But Stella and Mia have to make him understand that he's going to have to save face. Yanko knows he's going to have to do it. He just feels like he's completely misunderstood. Now with just Mia and Stella alone in the office, Mia starts pleading her case to Stella for Daniel to moderate. Stella tells Mia that Corey's made it clear. He wants Alex to moderate. Stella wants someone named Noreen. But the fact is, Daniel is on a long list of people that have thrown their hat in the ring. Mia continues to plead Daniel's case, but Stella tells Mia that she just doesn't feel like Daniel has the it factor. She feels like Daniel's more of a Ringo, not necessarily a Paul or John. Mia absolutely disagrees with this, but Stella's just not blown away from what she's seen from Daniel. Mia ends up heading out of the office, and Stella heads down to meet with Alex and Chip to try to get Alex to agree to do the debate. Stella puts on her fake face, acting the whole time that she really wants Alex to do this when really she's just doing Corey's bidding for her. But she gives Corey spiel, saying that it's not about viewers. Everyone's going to be watching the debate anyway. It's about the recent negative backlash in the press. They need to prove to the public that they can still provide quality content. And nothing's more quality than Alex Levy. Stella says, you're going to kill it, and you'll get a ton of buzz from it. But Alex takes that offensively. She doesn't feel like she needs buzz. And she tells Stella, I think there's some people here that have a lot more to prove. So, no. Stella says, okay, I hear you, but please reconsider think about it it's all i ask and once she leaves the room alex starts ripping stella to chip and chip starts informing alex on where stella came from she used to run a data media company and Corey paid a lot of money to absorb it and then thus making stella the head of news but alex just thinks that she's way too young and hasn't dealt with enough crap to be bossing people around down in the newsroom daniel had sought out mia to see how the conversation went and mia tells him that it probably won't be him And Daniel thinks that it might be a race thing or a sexual orientation thing. But Mia's honest with him and says, no, it's because Stella doesn't think you have the it factor. And that almost pisses off Daniel even more. Everybody then goes home. Corey is sitting in his room. He's really taking what Mitch said to heart. He's hired a private investigator to find out what stories Fred is planting and where he's planting them. And then gets a knock at the door and it's Bradley. When he opens the door, he sees her and says, I don't know who's moderating. And honestly, it's kind of beneath my position. She tells him, it's not about that. She walks inside and starts telling him that she doesn't like how their friendship has suffered. She's not okay with it. She wants to make amends. They have it out right then and there in Corey's room, but at the end of it, they do end up making amends. They hug it out, but at the end, he does let her know that Alex will probably be moderating the debate. He just doesn't see them using two straight white women to moderate the debate. Bradley thanks him for the honesty, and then she heads out. And she heads straight to Laura's place. She tells Laura that she took her advice, making amends with Corey. Asked about the debate, and Bradley tells her that she's not going to be doing it, and she gets it. The optics of it, having two white, straight women moderate a debate. And Laura says, wait, you just called yourself straight. Bradley says, yeah, because to most of the world, I am. But Laura questions as to why that is. And Bradley starts kind of explaining that most of the time she is straight, but she doesn't like putting a label on her sexuality. 
And the reason that Laura is getting so upset is because it is well known that she is a lesbian. And it's been known for a long, long time. And yet, yeah, now it's accepted. But 20 years ago, it wasn't. 20 years ago, she lost her job because of it. It wasn't like she wanted this information out there, but people talk and it got out there. And because of everything that she went to, there's something inside of her that wants to be resentful because Bradley isn't grateful for the gift that she's been given. Because Laura Peterson walked so that people like Bradley could run. She's basically telling Bradley, use the fact that you hook up with women as your advantage. But Bradley doesn't want to use her identity like that. Laura, however, questions that, thinking that it has more to do with the fact that Bradley is from a West Virginia small town that might not be accepting of people like her. Bradley gets up and says, you know what, this was a mistake. And Laura says, that's it, get out of here. Go live in your delusional world. And Bradley starts yelling at her how she's not delusional. She's not a country bumpkin. And then she smashes a pretty expensive vase. She then gets kicked out and has to just walk home with her thoughts. Everybody reconvenes back at the studio for the next day's airing. Yanko and Daniel start commiserating about the fact that Daniel doesn't like being labeled. Yanko doesn't like being misunderstood. But they're both going to have to eat shit. As they're setting up their segments during a commercial break, one of the production assistants runs in and tells Mia that the guest that they had booked is not going to make it. So Mia has to think on the fly. She tells the production assistant, just walk around, find somebody. Somebody's got to be in this building. And Chip, who overhears this, pulls the production assistant aside and says that there's somebody with Howard Stern's show. Grab that person and bring them down. But Mia walks over to Chip and says, what are you doing? Chip explains that he overheard that Howard Stern was having this guest. And Mia just says, don't undermine my authority. Even though Chip was trying to help, Mia once again says, don't undermine my authority. And it has Chip questioning if Mia even wants him there. Because earlier, Alex let it spill that Stella didn't want Chip there. And after the reaction he got when he came back from some of the producers, it's got Chip questioning if UBA is really the right choice for him. The show gets back on air, though. Yanko apologizes. He doesn't do a great job, though, I'll tell you that. He doesn't really use the right terminology, saying things like, I'm sorry if anybody was offended. But as Yanko is butchering this, Stella gets a phone call from Corey. He wants to know where they stand on the moderators because he wants to wrap this thing up that day. She gives him the update that Alex isn't going to do it. She keeps pushing for her person, Noreen. And Corey starts laughing. He's obviously stressed out. But he says, I'm just trying to get us to mid-March so we can launch this streaming service, which no one really wants, as if we're going to force feed them content. And I can't even trust you to do this thing. I mean, why did I give you the job? You didn't have to sell us your company. You chose to sell us your company. Things like this, this is the job. And Stella says, you know, I've been wondering why you brought me on. I mean, what's the point if you're not going to listen to anything I have to say? Is it just so you can parade an Asian woman around, making it look like you listen and you're woke? Don't just give me lip service about empowering me. Either let me do it or let me walk. Alex was never my choice for anything, and if that's what you want, do it yourself. Corey says, you're underestimating me, but you're also underestimating Alex. Talent is talent, and recognizing talent is an executive's only real job. So make this work now or don't. And Stella says, I got it. Everything done the same by a young Asian woman is looked at as different. She hangs up the phone, but then Corey's phone immediately rings because it's the private investigator. Earl lets him know that the genie's not going back in the bottle. There's too many blogs, too many newspapers, too many everything. Someone is going to end up running it. The only real way to kill the story is by going directly to Fred, which Corey doesn't want to do. So on top of everything Corey has to deal with, he also has this issue. After Stella hung up the phone started walking back to the production room when she passes by Daniel. And she has no idea that Daniel knows that she doesn't think he has the it factor. And she puts on her fake voice and says, I'm really looking forward to your segment. But at that moment, Daniel has decided to make a change. If she doesn't think he has the it factor, he's going to show her the it factor. And he does that by serenading Alex on the morning show. And none of this was planned. Everybody in the production room is... Very confused, but they have to let it go. They can't cut out of it. But as Daniel is poorly serenading Alex, Bradley, who just found out that Alex said no to the debate, goes to track down Stella and plead her case. She starts to tell Stella that there's something that Stella doesn't know about her. And you think maybe she's going to divulge that she is a lesbian or at the very least bisexual, but she doesn't. She can't get it out. She just says that she comes from a conservative family. It's not exactly the diversity that anyone's really looking for. When Stella walks out of this impromptu meeting and starts walking back to the production room, a woman walks up to her and gives her the overnight numbers from Alex's return, Alex's interview, and it was huge. Not only that, but sponsors are coming back. Looks like Corey's move paid off and maybe Stella was wrong. Stella walks back in the production room at the very end of Daniel's serenading of Alex. But when the show ends... 
Everyone's telling Daniel what a great job he did, how awesome it was. But there's one person who is clearly not amused, and that is Mia. He also gets news from Stella that he won't be doing it. Stella, though, has to go get Alex to do this debate. She walks into her dressing room, and right off the bat, the conversation is pretty combative. Stella knows that Alex doesn't really like her, or respect her for that matter. But the conversation flips from combative to a genuine appeal. Stella tells Alex that when she did what she did, she made a connection with the women of this country. Even though Alex doesn't think that's true, it is. Stella tells her, you mean something to these women. As a leader, as a feminist, I want you to be these things. So if you're looking for a brand, there it is. And honestly, I don't know why you don't want to take that mantle. Nine months ago, you opened a door. Walk through it. She wraps up by telling Alex, by the way, it was a great show today. And then she walks out. And that night, Alex heads home and starts looking up topics for the debate. That same night, Bradley does not head home. She heads to Laura's place. She buys her a $300 gift card to buy a new vase. And she heads to her place and starts apologizing because she just doesn't really know who she is. Laura, though, doesn't really seem receptive to the apology. She starts walking back in her apartment, but that's when Bradley just grabs her and hugs her. Laura's kind of surprised by this, but she does hug her back. And it seems like the two women are on their way to making amends, much like Bradley and Corey. And speaking of Corey, he had a meeting with Sybil. He explains to Sybil exactly what's going on with the Hannah stories, but he needs her help in killing it. He says to her, you're friends with Fred, and I need you to talk to him and have him stop. And while Sybil feels terrible for Hannah's family, she's not friends with Fred. In fact, she tells Corey, the last time I spoke to Fred, he told me that you were the best business decision. And if I'm being honest, I don't think that that's true at all. You let the talent walk all over you if you call Bradley Jackson talent, and you push us hard to buy out Fred rather than have a true independent investigation. That right there brings up all sorts of questions, questions that honestly I don't need answered. This is a business, not a morality play. If the stories he's planting aren't true, then the girl's family is going to have a hell of a liable lawsuit. The fact that you showed up here instead of calling Fred directly proves to me why Fred pushed so hard to get you here, when he clearly hated you with a passion. Actions have consequences, so whatever those consequences are, it's really none of my business. In episode 5 on the heels of that conversation with Sybil, Corey calls up Fred, wakes him up at about 3 a.m. Italian time, And he tells him, you got to kill these stories. I know what you're doing. Stop it. Fred says, Corey, I tried to contact you to get the case dismissed, and you never called me back, so I took matters in my own hands. And by the way, from what I understand, they're not nasty. They're true. Fred then actually kind of blackmails Corey because it was Corey's idea to pay off Fred. Fred sort of talked him into it at the time because Fred knew that the end was near. So he convinced him that he would be his Nixon, Corey would be Gerald Ford. He would take it over, but he would also pardon him. And by pardon, I mean give him a fat settlement. And that's exactly what Corey did. So Fred tells him, the woke mob is not going to enjoy hearing that you paid me off. So if that deal goes away, there's no reason for me to spare you. The next day, TMS goes off without a hitch. They plug the fact that they'll be doing the Democratic presidential debates. They explain the roles of both Alex and Bradley, and then they start going into post-show. For Alex, that means sitting in a room with a bunch of production assistants going over possible questions for the candidates. But she is extremely stressed out. Alex, though, has to cut this practice short because she gets a note saying Audra is in her office, and that's a surprise. When Alex asks her what she's doing, Audra says, oh, you know, I was having lunch with Daniel and decided to just kind of pop by, even though the two don't really have that kind of relationship. But the real reason Audra showed up was because Maggie Brenner's book comes out in a month, and her first stop at the book tour is going to be at YDA. Audra plays this off like, Alex, if you don't want me to do it, I won't. But in reality, it's kind of bragging about the fact that not only is she going to get this interview with Maggie Brenner first, she's also going to get a copy of the book early. She's going to know exactly what's inside of it, and that eats Alex up. The fact that she doesn't know what's being written about her kills her. As Audra heads out, Alex says, whoa, 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 let's cut the bullshit. I've always been gracious to you, have I not? And Audra kind of chuckles and says, oh my god, you actually believe that. But hey, passes in the past, and we'll let water be under that bridge. And then Audra walks out, and Alex is pretty surprised about that. Alex then returns to the meeting room to find an empty meeting room. Chip dismissed everybody because Alex was gone for so long, and that's when Alex fills Chip in on the YDA Maggie Brenner situation. She tells Chip, you gotta get me that book, but Chip says, I I can't. They're certainly not gonna give it to me. And Alex starts screaming at him about the fact that he's not even back more than a few months before he starts saying what he can't do. 
Chip, however, tries to get the conversation back on track, saying, you know what, we have a lot of work to do. Let's just focus on the debate. But Alex injured her back, and it's flaring up. That also might be one of the reasons why she's kind of being a bitch. So she leaves early. Later that day, Chip's fiance Madeline, stops by, and one of the reasons why she stopped by was to actually meet Alex. But she's surprised to find out that Alex left early with that back issue. And Chip tells Madeline, yeah, it got real today. I can't believe she actually convinced me to come back. Madeline tells him, hey, whatever happens, we'll figure it out. And the two head home. The next day, Corey is planning on going to Green Bay. Kyle stops by to give him everything he'll need, including his itinerary. And as he's leaving, Kyle says, by the way, you know who's dating? Laura Peterson and Bradley Jackson. Corey chuckles it and says, no, they're not. But Kyle starts saying how he can't confirm it, but his friends saw the two walking down the street. And Corey cuts him off and says, nobody likes a gossip, Kyle. Although Corey realizes how that sounds, so he clarifies it by saying, well, one, it's not true. But two, nobody likes gossip, so don't do it. And it seems like the reason why Corey is so adamant it's not true is because he might have firsthand experience that Bradley isn't a lesbian. There might have been something that happened the night before Bradley barged into the UBA offices demanding that Corey come back. Might have been a drunken fling, although we don't know for sure. Either way, the next day, all the talent at UBA, i.e. Alex, Laura Peterson, and Bradley fly out to Vegas for the Democratic presidential debates. And Alex's mood has not changed at all. The group touches down in Vegas a few hours later, and as Alex and Chip are walking to the hotel, they see from afar Maggie Brenner. And Alex does a very awkward pretending not to see Maggie so she doesn't come up and talk to her. Maggie, however, notices it but doesn't say anything, just getting in a cab. But it's become obvious the real reason for all of Alex's stress has suddenly arrived in Las Vegas. While that group was going to Vegas, Corey was going to Green Bay in a secret meeting that nobody other than Eric knew about, and that was because he wanted to meet with Hannah's father. As soon as he walks into Hannah's father's bar, Hannah's father knows who he is. And as you can imagine, he tells him, you need to leave, but Corey has come trying to convince Hannah's father to take the money. And Hannah's father says that the reason why he wants as much money as he asked for is because that's what they gave that scumbag Fred Micklin. It becomes clear to Corey that he has to take the kid gloves off. So he tells Hannah's father, your daughter is about to be smeared in the papers. They're going to say horrible things like she slept to get information. She was a drug addict. So I'm begging you, take the money because they want to make this as muddy as possible. So you're in a situation where you just give up and you get nothing. I want to do right by your daughter. UBA should pay for this, but take what they're offering you. And to Corey's surprise, Hannah's father asks if the allegations are true. Corey has to let him know that, to his knowledge, yeah, some of them actually are. He was only in Wisconsin for that meeting, and when he touches down back in New York, he gets a phone call from their fixer, who lets him know that the stories about Hannah have been killed everywhere except one publication. And the only way that this publication will kill the story about Hannah is if they have something more salacious. So Corey is fighting an uphill battle to get the whole thing scrubbed. The next day, out in Vegas, Alex goes through rehearsal for the presidential debate, and then afterwards, she goes and hangs out with Chip, but her back is still acting up. As they're walking back to their rooms, they start talking about the Maggie Brenner book and what could possibly be in it, and Chip throws a possibility out there of something that Alex said, but she stops him and says, Oh, I didn't say that. And Chip tries to tell her, Yeah, you did, but Alex is adamant that she did not say it. Of course, Chip knows that she did. So Chip has to tell her, sometimes you have a selective memory. You forget how things actually played out. And that's when it dawns on Alex that Chip never forgets anything. So she asks him, oh my god, did you did you talk to Maggie Brenner? And Chip admits, yeah, I'm off the record, I did. They both start screaming at each other, Chip reminding her that he had just gotten fired. Alex yelling at him for not disclosing this information when he took the job. And when cooler heads prevailed, Chip tells her, I just needed people to know that I'm not this horrible person. And Alex says, okay, you want to look like a hero, but what does that mean for me? And Chip says, you look like you. But after the conversation she had with Audra, and now hearing Chip tell her she has selective memory over a comment that she thinks was pretty heinous, she's wondering, what does that even mean? I'm going to look like me. And later that night, she can't sleep. So she ends up hobbling down the hall and knocking on Maggie Brenner's door and demanding a copy of the book. Maggie, however, tells her that she doesn't have a copy, but Alex starts rummaging around her hotel room for it. And while she doesn't find a copy, she does find the title, The Wrong Side of the Bed. It's got Alex and Mitch on the cover. Maggie asks her, is there something specific you want to know? And Alex tells her that Laura Peterson insinuated that her and Mitch had slept together. And Maggie says, yeah, that's in the book. And Alex starts crying, saying that it's not true, but in a way that makes you think it is true. And telling Maggie she doesn't want to be associated with Mitch at all. Especially not in that way. But it's too late. 
Maggie had offered Alex the opportunity to comment on the book, but Alex never responded. Even after Alex says that she'll sue Maggie for defamation and libel, Maggie simply says, well, if it's not true, then sue. Maggie tells her, the book is done, and I'm not changing that, and I'm not going to include this little epilogue, so don't think I don't care. Alex starts crying, begging Maggie not to do this, but then she asks exactly who told her that the two had sex, asking if it was Mitch. And Maggie says, I did speak to him briefly. I can quote him for you. He said, fuck off. So if it wasn't Mitch, then who was it? Alex is left to just go back to her room. But one person it possibly could have been is Laura Peterson, who is in another hotel room hanging out with Bradley. And Bradley inquires as to the bad blood between Laura and Alex. Because while Bradley doesn't like Alex particularly, she doesn't have the disdain for her that Laura does. So Laura tells her that when Alex first showed up in New York, Laura was at YDA and she was doing really well for herself. And there was a certain amount of people in their inner circle that knew she was a lesbian. Alex started hanging out with those people, and she seemed fine with it. But shortly after Alex found out the truth, that's when YDA found out. Laura ended up losing her job. Now, Laura can't prove that it was Alex, but one thing she does know is that Alex never came to her defense, going so far as to, a few years later, seeing Laura on the street and acting like she didn't know who she was, completely ignoring her. That's something that Laura Peterson will never forget. She's never brought this up to Alex, but she just doesn't want to waste her time with her. Bradley then gets a text message from Corey asking if she's up, and Bradley lies to her saying, actually, yeah, your text message just woke me up. But she gets caught in her lie because Corey had called her room to no answer. So Bradley ends up calling him up to see what's going on, digging down deeper into that lie, trying to hide where she really is, which is in Laura's room. And as she's talking, Corey can hear in the background Laura talk to Bradley. Bradley, however, tells Laura, it's Corey on the line. You got to shut up. But now Corey is thinking that the gossip that Kyle was talking about might actually be true. Corey called, though, not to find out if Bradley was a lesbian, but for some advice. He tells Bradley about the situation, about how this one publication won't back down. And Bradley reminds him this was the one thing Hannah did not want. Her name just dragged through the mud. Corey asks her, if I can find another story and to keep Hannah's name out of the public eye, do I do it? And Bradley emphatically says, yes. The two hang up, and Bradley has to get ready for the debates the next day. But while Alex was supposed to host them, she doesn't. She actually flies home on a private jet, and Eric, Bradley, and their chief political reporter at UBA end up having to manage the debate. Now, one person I haven't mentioned at UBA this episode is Yanko Flores. He's noticed that he was taken off assignment from being outside, so he goes to Mia and asks what's up. And Mia says that the apology that he gave didn't go over well. So their plan is to take him down talk to some Native American tribes, find out their culture, film the whole thing, and hopefully that'll squash this whole ordeal. But Yanko hates the fact that it has to be filmed. He thinks it'd be way more sincere if it's not on camera. But Mir reminds him if it's not on camera, our listeners don't know about it. This sends Yanko off. He stands up for himself and says, I'm not doing it. This is ridiculous. I already apologized. I'm sorry, but no. I'm not going to genuflect at the altar of Stella's progressive bullshit. Stella's full of shit. So I'm sorry, Mia, but I'm not doing this. Yanko storms off set, goes to his dressing room, cleans up, and goes to get lunch. But as he's coming back to the UBA office, Stella's walking out. And right before she gets in her car, some douchebag yells, Hey, don't give me the China flu. And of course, Stella takes exception to it, calling him ignorant. But she hops in the car and gets out of there. She clearly is shook by this, though. And unbeknownst to her, Yanko comes to her defense. He walks up to the guy and says, Dude, what's your problem? First of all, she's Korean, idiot. And that's when the guy goes in on Yanko because he's Latin American. I mean, the guy is just a complete piece of shit racist. When the guy puts his hands on Yanko, Yanko beats the crap out of him. Problem for Yanko is it's caught on camera phone and he knows he has an issue. While Yanko tried to do the right thing, he knows this is going to come back to bite him. And finally, let's head over to Italy with Mitch. He's sequestered with Paolo, going through quarantine, but also finishing up the documentary. And they do that. Paola ends up asking him, why did you decide to quarantine with me? And Mitch says, I like you. I like your company. But just to be clear, I'm not going to have sex with you. He realizes how arrogant that sounds, so he immediately starts walking it back. But he just tells Paola, it's not that you're not attractive. I'm just broken. And Paola is completely understanding because she knows. Later that night, Paola asks him, let me interview you. And Mitch is completely against it. She lets him know it's just for me, just for practice, nothing else. So he agrees. They set up the camera, and Mitch shows real contrition. He says he never wanted to be this guy, and it was his hubris that got in the way. He really thought this is what Hannah wanted. But his biggest regret wasn't sleeping with Hannah. It was the fact that when he was trying to claw his way back, 
he actually had the audacity to ask her for help. Even after she told him how she felt in that situation, he deflected and still wanted her help. He admits the old Mitch Kessler is a monster, but he's changed. But even nine, ten months later, the whole situation with Hannah and how it played out still eats at Mitch. In episode six, Corey, along with UBA's fixer, goes back to that publication and says, hey, we have a juicier story. We've got two female anchors in a gay relationship. At first, the publication's like, ah, it's not that juicy, kind of old hat, this isn't 1999 anymore. But in order to kill the Hannah story, Corey goes so far as to tell the publication where they're going to be so that they can snap photos and get, quote, proof of it. Bradley, however, is still in Las Vegas, reporting on the DNC. She's doing a great job, by the way, but back at UBA, Daniel continues to make some waves. He does an interview with a guy named Peter Bullard, who's doing a new show for UBA+. Plus. It's going to be an interview show. But instead of interviewing him, Daniel turns the interview awkward and combative because I guess this Peter Bullard guy had said some not nice things about Daniel before. Daniel decided to stick up for himself. It's completely off script, though. And it's one that Bullard ends up taking exception to, calling not only Stella, but Corey to complain about it. The next day, everybody from Vegas returns. Mia gives Bradley a nice ovation and lets her know that she's going to be heading to Phoenix and doing her own debate. Not filling in this time, but actually doing her own debate since she killed it out there. The one issue they have is nobody has an update on where exactly Alex is, and that includes Chip, who's supposed to be her producer. Chip is making excuse after excuse, really hiding behind the fact that her back was acting up. In reality, he doesn't have any idea where she is. And the network is getting antsy. They paid for her to come back, and she was back for all of, I don't know, seven days? And now she's disappeared once again. So Stella and Mia have to meet with Chip to try to get an answer on when he thinks she might be back. But Chip's timetable is pretty vague. Corey then walks into the meeting to talk about the whole Peter Bullard situation because Bullard is really mad. And Mia takes Daniel's side of things, saying he thought he was sparring. But that's not the way Peter Bullard saw it, which means it's not the way Corey sees it. Corey then tries to get an update on what's going on with Alex, but Chip tells him the same thing he told both Mia and Stella. Really isn't one. They're just kind of in wait-and-see mode. And that means they need to find a replacement for Alex in the meantime. They start throwing out some ideas, and that's when Chip throws out, well, what about Laura Peterson? And Corey loves the idea. Not only is she a big name, but she's going to drive Alex nuts. It might actually drive Alex so nuts that she returns. Corey then calls Laura Peterson, and he's unaware that Bradley's over at her house. And Corey throws the idea out there, and Bradley begs her to take it, which she ultimately does. After Laura gets off the phone, Bradley suggests that maybe she just stay there. I mean, they have to head to the same place anyway, and they have to get up really early. And Laura takes it one step further by saying, you know, you can bring some stuff over. It's fine. So Bradley heads back to her hotel room to grab some things, but she has an unwelcome visitor. It's her brother who showed up out of the blue, puts a whole wrench in her quasi-moving into Laura's place. Bradley has to text Laura back saying, I'm not going to be able to make it. My brother showed up. She's also pretty suspicious. Her brother's had substance abuse issues in the past, and he just shows up out of the blue. It begs the question, why is he there? But his answer is he misses Bradley, and Bradley isn't their mother. So Bradley has to scrap the plans that she had and entertain her bro. The next day, Bradley and Laura head into TMS separately. And as Laura is walking in, she notices Chip in his office sitting there in the dark. She walks in and starts kind of poking fun at him, but starts asking about how Alex is doing. Chip gives her the spiel that she's fine, her back is acting up, she should be okay, should be back soon. And Laura tells him, I just wanted to make sure she was okay. I mean, Maggie was concerned. She said Alex was in quite a state when she came to her hotel room. And this is the first that Chip is hearing about any of this. He plays it off like he was aware, but he definitely wasn't. And he chalks it up to her being, quote, not her best that night, saying that she had mixed prescription pills and she was feeling funny. He tries to find out from Laura exactly what Alex might have said, but Laura says, Maggie didn't tell me what she said, she just was concerned. Once Laura leaves, Chip ends up calling Alex's place and asks her just to pick up the phone, but she doesn't because she's not in her place. Once Laura left Corey's office, though, she doesn't feel all that comfortable returning to morning television. She's a pro, though. She gets ready to go on television. Stella and Corey come down to see how everything goes. And while Bradley and Laura are playful, they don't give off any vibes that they're actually together. Shortly after the broadcast starts, though, Stella ends up leaving the control room because she has to meet with Yanko over the fight. She saw the video. She knows that Yanko stuck up for her, but she still has to address the situation. As she heads to her office, she gets stopped by Sybil. And Sybil wants to make sure that because of the fact that Yanko was sticking up for her, her judgment won't be clouded on the situation. 
Stella says, with all due respect, Sybil, decisions can be made without you standing behind me. And Sybil says, well, with all due respect, I'm giving you all the respect you deserve. You and Corey were brought here to clean things up, and it seems like you've done the exact opposite. The talent is running roughshod all over you guys. These are people. You can control them. And if you can't, you find people that you can. I made it clear to Corey that it was the board's decision to fire Bradley Jackson for her, quote, mystery illness. But you two decide to put her on air the next morning. And Stella lets her know that is complete news to me. Sybil, though, doesn't believe that at all. She reminds Stella that Corey is going to bat for her a lot. So, quote, don't act like you two aren't two peas in a pod. Stella then goes in her office and waits for Yanko to show up. And when he does, he's got a little bit of a black eye. Right off the bat, she thanks him for sticking up for her. The two seem to bond over the fact that she was the weird Korean kid and he was the weird Cuban kid. Yanko thinks, though, that that's it. That's the whole meeting, her thanking him. He gets up to leave and Stella says, wait, where are you going? I still have to suspend you. And Yanko can't believe that she's about to suspend him for sticking up for her. He tells Stella, I'm a racist when I say spirit animal, but then I beat up a racist and I get suspended? I mean, what am I supposed to do? And Stella says, you're supposed to do the weather. And Yanko just walks out. And ironically, he walks out as they're doing the weather on the morning show. And his villain is terrible. It gives Bradley and Laura a little bit of a break. Bradley takes the opportunity to check in on her brother. She had a little bit of an awkward morning running into him. She was checking him for drugs and he woke up. She notices that he's called a few times, so she reminds him, I can't answer, I'm on TV. And that's when he sends her an article saying that Bradley and Laura are in a relationship. Bradley gets extremely uncomfortable with this. And Laura tries to calm her down by saying, it's going to be okay. She also has to pull herself together because she goes back on the air in 10 seconds. And as she's sitting there talking about Groucho Marx on the air, the control room is seeing exactly what has her so frazzled. Most of the talent actually starts talking about whether they believe it's true or not. Daniel says aloud that he hopes the story isn't true, and Yanko's replacement says why, because being gay is your thing? And Daniel says no, because I think it's horrible and painful to be publicly outed. It's nobody's business. This causes the weatherman to apologize and just walk away. As soon as the segment is over, Bradley runs to her dressing room to just try and get her thoughts together. And that's when Laura walks in. At first, Bradley says, you shouldn't be here. I mean, what happens if people see us both leaving this room? And Laura says, well, if it were true, we'd have to make sure that we weren't seen together. But this was just bullshit gossip, so we're in here discussing how we're going to handle it. Bradley, though, isn't quite catching up on the fact that Laura is insinuating it didn't happen. It's all lies. She's still extremely uncomfortable and... Laura says, why are you so upset? And Bradley says, it's because I don't want my private life public. Laura asks, well, can you talk to your brother about the situation? But Bradley says, no, I don't want anybody knowing my business, especially my family. Laura eventually convinces Bradley that this will all be okay, even though it's completely messed up. And Bradley comes back and closes out the show. As Mia is leaving the control room after the show, she overhears Chip talking to Raina about the fact that he doesn't know exactly where Alex is. He hasn't even talked to her. If it wasn't for the fact that Alex was talking to a production assistant named Isabella, he'd be legitimately concerned. And when Mia overhears this, she flips out. Unbeknownst to both Chip and Raina, Mia is on edge because of the fact that Vanity Fair is posting an excerpt from Maggie Brenner's book. And the headline says that Mitch Kessler targeted black women. And it makes Mia completely uncomfortable. She has a little bit of PTSD. So when she catches Chip and Raina talking, it sets her off. Chip apologizes to Mia because he can see that something's going on with her and tells her, I just want to help. And Mia says, well, if you want to help, then get my lead anchor back. And that forces Chip over to Alex's apartment. He enters very tentatively saying, hey, Alex, I'm here. Don't be scared. But he doesn't find Alex. That's when Chip discovers that Alex isn't there at all. There is someone there, however. It's Isabella. And they both are pretty surprised to see each other. And that's when Chip starts putting two and two together, that Isabella is basically house-sitting for Alex, which means that Isabella probably knows where Alex is. Chip says, I need you to tell me where she is, but Isabella says, I can't. She told me not to tell anybody. And when Chip says, well, I'm not anybody, Isabella lets him know that Alex made it specifically known she was not to tell Chip where Alex was. The conversation, though, turns pretty hostile. Isabella finds some cause to get mad at Chip. I think she picked sexism, but it might have went white knight. I don't know. It was weird. It culminates in Isabella just screaming at Chip, and Chip just kind of throwing his hands up in the air and saying, "Uh, okay, and leaving, knowing that he's not getting any answers from Isabella at all. 
That same night, Bradley has yet to go home. She's hiding in her dressing room, and Laura calls her to see how her conversation with her brother went, only to find out that she's scared to actually confront him. After a little bit of back and forth, Laura convinces Bradley that she needs to go home. She needs to actually see her brother and talk to him about the situation. So Bradley reluctantly does. And as soon as Bradley enters the room, it's obvious on why she wanted to avoid her brother because the fighting starts right away. Her brother lets her know that their mother is completely embarrassed by this. They come from a very small town. Everybody's talking about it. And the two end up getting in a fight about why Bradley hasn't revealed this information before. They start fighting about their mother. And Bradley yells at him, I thought you came here to get away from her. And Hal says, no, I came here because I'm on drugs. I'm using Hal goes on to tell Bradley that their mother has gotten insufferable. Even with Bradley's help, she's actually gotten worse. He knows that if he's around Bradley, he won't use, but his mom kind of drives him to use. The fighting, however, gets interrupted when Corey knocks on the door, and Corey can hear the fighting inside. Bradley is trying to get her brother to calm down. She ends up leaving Hal behind to go talk to Corey, and he's shown up there to tell her that as far as the network is concerned, she doesn't have to address the situation at all. He also lets her know that if she wants to sue, the network will back her. But Bradley doesn't know if she wants to sue. She's just kind of confused and taking the whole situation in. She asks Corey, why was today so hard? I mean, why do I care what those horrible people think of me? And Corey asks, you mean the public? And Bradley says, no, I mean my family. I mean, when I'm with Laura, I see who I aspire to be. And then when I'm with my brother, I see what I really am. Corey tries to make her feel better by telling her, hey, you're your own thing and it's working out pretty great for you. Bradley then starts to say, maybe this is a good thing. Maybe this will force me to say that I actually care about somebody. And I've never really done that before, but I realize I I do want Laura. She then thanks Corey for the mini therapy session and walks back in the room and tells Hal, you gotta go. In episode 7, we head back over to Italy. The coronavirus continues to rage war all over the country. And Mitch is two days away from being over with quarantine. So he tells Paula, I think I need to go home. But before I do, I need to tell you something. And she gets really excited. But the thing he has to tell her is, I need you to delete that interview. It's not that I don't trust you. It's just I need that thing gone. And she kind of gets upset because it sounds like he doesn't trust her. But he explains, I don't trust what could happen if that thing got out. I don't trust the world. She's pretty upset, but she agrees that she will delete the interview. He then gets an alert on his phone that somebody's at the front gate, so he heads out, and boy is he surprised to find Alex Levy. He explains that he's in quarantine, but she doesn't care. She's traveled all the way across the world to see him, so he lets her in, but she didn't come to visit him out of concern. The first thing she does is yell at him for telling Maggie Brenner to fuck off. You would think that would be a good thing, but what she was actually looking for was for him to tell Maggie Brenner that nothing ever happened. She explains this book coming out could be really bad for her. Mitch says no. He's not going to make a statement. And that's when Alex really goes in on him. She tells him how she walked out of the debate, and she kind of blames that on him. She tells him how she walked out of work a week and a half in, and she kind of blames that on him. She tells him, I need you to release a statement that me and you never happened. But he tells her, no, Alex, I'm done lying. And she can't believe that he's deciding now, of all times, that he's going to stop lying. He asks her, why do I have to lie? And she explains, it's because I lied. Laura Peterson asked me on national television if me and you ever had sex, and I said no. And he asked her, you really think that's going to mess up your life, just being associated with me? And she explains, yeah, I'm worried about being canceled because you got canceled. No one will respect me if I slept with you. Mitch thinks about it for a little bit and says, all right, I'll do it. But here I thought you were doing this because you wanted to protect your children. Or maybe your husband. But no, it's the mere fact that having consensual sex with me was so vile that it'll end your career. Paolo comes in and breaks up the awkward conversation. Both women kind of give Mitch the what is she doing here look, and Paolo apologizes and leaves the room. And once she does, Alex starts ripping into Mitch about how he has another woman here. Mitch explains that he hasn't had sex with her. He doesn't want to violate her like that, ruin her, and maybe a book comes out, kind of like somebody else he knows. But Alex just finds it ironic. Mitch tries to explain that Paolo's a documentarian and a really good one, but Alex really isn't buying it, and she doesn't really care. She tells Mitch, I need you to call your publicist and release a statement. Although Mitch doesn't have a publicist, he was dropped, so he's going to have to do it on his own. That, however, is not good enough for Alex. She wants it right then and there. Even though Mitch wants to actually, like, type something up, just to get her out of the house, he writes, I did not fuck Alex Levy. Best regards, Mitch. Alex yells at him for just wasting her time, and what she's worried about is Mitch not doing it. So Mitch gives her his new number and sends her on her way. But when Alex leaves, Paolo comes in and says, you can't leave this like that. So she kind of urges Mitch to go outside and 
sort of make amends with Alex. Luckily for Mitch, Alex is trapped on the property. She can't get out because of the gate. Alex is still pretty pissed off about just everything in general, but Mitch tells her that his relationship with her is probably the second most important relationship he has on the world. So he just wants her to leave there with an understanding of sorts. He doesn't want to spend the rest of his life hating Alex, and he doesn't want her to spend the rest of her life hating him. So he talks, she listens, kind of. She gets tired of it pretty quickly and says, all right, I gotta go, I gotta catch a flight. The two, however, don't end on good terms. They get into a bit of a fight because Alex has no response for anything Mitch said. And Mitch asks her, were you really going to say that I raped you? And Alex doesn't even have a response for that. Just telling him, I need you to release a statement. Mitch yells, yeah, I'll release the goddamn statement. But just so you know, I don't think what you did with me really qualifies as sex. Alex then leaves and figures out pretty quickly that getting a plane back to the U.S. is going to be a pain. The whole country is in lockdown. She's having big issues, even though she's offering a lot of money. So when she leaves Mitch's house, she heads straight for the airport, although it's quite a drive. Mitch, however, walks back into his house, where Paula walks up with her computer, and wants to show him in person that she's going to delete the interview. Even though Mitch says it's not necessary to show him, he trusts her, Paula does it anyway. Paula then tells Mitch, it's time for me to go. This kind of takes Mitch off guard because he knows that Paula doesn't actually want to leave, but Paula thanks him and then heads back to her place. Right before she leaves, though, she lets Mitch know that she got a message from the professor's daughter. He passed away. She's going to send flowers to his family on their behalf. The next day, Alex Levy is woken up by a police officer. She started drifting off on the way to the airport, so she decided to pull on over to the road, just take a quick nap. That nap turned into full-on sleep. She gets woken up by an officer who's wondering what exactly she's doing in the middle of a quarantine zone, sleeping in her car. She explains that she's heading to the airport, she was visiting a friend, but he's suspicious because of the whole, you know, country being shut down thing. He tells her, I'm not letting you leave until you actually book a flight out of here, but her phone's dead. And the only number that she has on hand is Mitch's. So the police officer has to call Mitch, the only person in the country that she knows. And Alex Levy has to go back to Mitch's hat in hand. When she gets to his house, though, there's a note in the door that just says, come on in. And then when she gets in the living room, there's a plate of food and it says, here's breakfast for you. I'll be upstairs. I really don't want to talk to you anymore. It's too hard. I left the statement for you in the envelope. And Alex starts to break down a little bit. She drops some of the silverware on the ground. And that's when Mitch comes in and says, you know... You didn't have to fly all this way to, like, mess up my stuff. She starts kind of laughing, and they start cleaning it up. But Alex is not doing well. Mitch can see it all over her face. She's crying. She's kind of inconsolable. And as she's crying, she tells Mitch, I don't know who I am or what I'm supposed to be doing. And I just miss you, and gives him a hug. Once Alex calms down, Mitch is able to contact somebody and book her a flight out. She's got a flight at 6 a.m. Now they've got a few hours to kill, so they head in the house and start playing Trivial Pursuit. He asks Alex if she can help Paula because of the documentarian thing. Obviously, he doesn't really have the contacts he used to, and Alex does. Alex agrees to that, by the way. They then put on some records and start dancing. And then they start talking about cancel culture and how Mitch isn't dead. Maybe his career is, but he's not. And Alex ends up dropping a bombshell on him during this dance session. She tells him that after they did what they did in Chile, a.k.a. the sex stuff, Alex thought she was pregnant. She actually wanted to have it. She was excited to have it. She loved Mitch, not as like a lover, but just as a person. She was so thrilled to make their partnership a lifelong thing. She knew it would be extremely difficult, but she would stay up at night racking her brain on thinking of how she would keep this baby. In the long run, though, wasn't meant to be. She was just late. They ended up spending the rest of the night dancing, drinking wine. But at some point in the middle of the night, they start having a conversation about how Mitch can get bitter sometimes. And that leads him to going to some pretty dark places. He lost everything he thought gave his life meaning. Because of this, he wants to make sure that she appreciates everything she has. They end up falling asleep together, but he ends up waking up in the middle of the night, heading to the bathroom, and when he wakes up, she wakes up. Mitch turns on the television and it's the news. And after the COVID-19 news, they move into the Mitch Kessler, Alex Levy news. The excerpt from Maggie's book that is to appear in Vanity Fair leaked, the one that says that Mitch Kessler targeted African-American women, and it sends Mitch into a rage. He feels like that they're just trying to dig his grave deeper and deeper. He turns to Alex and says, you don't actually think I targeted black women, do you? I mean, I'm attracted to them, but Alex is really turned off by this news and just says, "Uh, I, I gotta go, even though her plane isn't for a few hours. He once again asks her, Alex, you didn't actually believe I did that, do you? And Alex says, Mitch, just because you didn't mean to do it doesn't make it okay. And Mitch just can't understand it. The fact that maybe he did something that he didn't realize he was doing at the time, he kind of has a mini breakdown. 
he whines to Alex, I just want to be a good person. And Alex tells him, I I know, but can't do this right now. I just, I got to go. And Mitch says, so you come here and you get me to tell the world that you are someone you're not. So you don't get canceled like I did. And you'll never tell anybody who you think I really am. I mean, come on. Alex starts getting pretty emotional and Mitch just goes to give her a hug. Alex does ask, can you still release the statement? And Mitch says, sure. Alex then heads off to go catch her flight. Mitch then texts Pala, okay, everything's fine now. Will you come back, please? And Pala says, do you still even want me to come? And Mitch says, actually, can I come to you? I want to be in your world for a while. So Pala says, sure. And Mitch has come over to get a second opinion on the whole targeting black women thing. But instead of giving him an answer, Pala ends up kissing him. Mitch pushes her away saying, I don't think this is a good idea. And Pala says, I know it is because of that. Mitch eventually ends up giving in. The two end up sleeping together. It seems like they both had a good time, but Pala realizes that she's out of cigarettes. Mitch offers to go get them and heads out, and on the drive, he starts going into one of those dark places he was talking about, thinking about every negative thing that he's heard about himself, about how bad of a person he is. He starts drifting off kind of mentally, and as he's turning a corner, he has to swerve out of the way to avoid a car. And that's when he starts going off of a cliff. But instead of re-grabbing the wheel, he actually pulls his hands back. And he just lets the car go straight off. Episode 8 takes place one day after Alex leaves Italy. One day after Bradley kicks her brother out of her house. Corey ends up showing up at the office early because they're launching UBA Plus that day. So it's a big day for him. He ends up running into Chip on the way to his office. And Chip is still stressed out because he can't find Alex. And he's trying to keep that a secret. He ends up calling her once again. She once again doesn't answer. And he ends up leaving a pretty scathing voicemail. And she's not the only one who's stressed out. Mia's pretty stressed out. The Vanity Fair excerpt is going viral, and it's not hard to figure out who they're talking about. Mia even hears a couple of her coworkers discussing the matter not too far away from earshot. And then the final stressed out person is Bradley. She ends up tracking down Laura's assistant and asking when she's going to be there because she wants to talk to her. She then grabs another production assistant and asks him to book Hal a flight out of the city. She runs to her dressing room to call Laura to tell her that she wants to talk to her before the show. And Lara reluctantly tells her, I'm in my dressing room, so what is it? Bradley tells her about the incident with Hal the previous night and about how she kicked him out. But Lara reminds her that she didn't ask her to do that. She also tells her, this is a lot to take on before I go do a show, so I'm going to need to get my head in the right place. Can we talk about this later? Bradley, however, wants to keep talking about it, but Lara has to let in hair and makeup. So Bradley doesn't have a choice but to let her off the phone. When they finally do meet up on set, it's kind of awkward. As TMS kicks off, Corey, Stella, and a couple of the lawyers are discussing all of the negative publicity, and Corey is trying to spin it. It's actually good publicity because it shows the change from UBA from one year ago. Even though Corey continues to push how this is a good thing, the rest of them are pretty concerned about the book. Corey's assistant, Kyle, though, bursts through the door and tells one of the lawyers that he's getting a call and it's pretty urgent, so the lawyer goes to take it. And when he comes back, he puts the person on speakerphone and says, can you repeat that? And it's an Italian journalist trying to get a comment from UBA about the death of Mitch Kessler. And this is the first that any of them are hearing this, so they're pretty floored. The lawyer asks, have you been able to confirm this? But the journalist says, no, 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 I'm not trying to confirm it. I'm asking you for your thoughts on it. The lawyer once again repeats, no, 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 I need to know if you have been able to confirm this is actually true. And the journalist tells him that he was in a car accident in Riva. And Stella points out that if that's there in Lake Como, that's where Mitch was when that girl was caught yelling at him on camera. They end up telling the journalists that the network has no comment until the facts can be verified. But Stella runs down to the newsroom and lets Mia and a couple of the other producers know about this unconfirmed report. And now they're frantically trying to get two confirmed sources. They know this is a big deal. They can't let another network break the news that Mitch Kessler has died. They also realize they can't report it until his family knows. Mia then goes racing down to Alex's dressing room, knocking on the door, and when Chip answers, he starts apologizing for some reason about the excerpt, feeling guilty. But Mia tells him, shut up, Mitch might be dead. I need you to get Alex in here. This might be fake news, but the network wants her on standby because they want her to break the story if it ends up being true. So Chip runs off to try to track down Alex while the rest of the producers start combing the internet to try to find out if this could be true. They get some information, like they do get pictures of a car accident, but they don't actually get any confirmation that Mitch was killed in it. Slowly, though, they start piecing together some details that could help them out, like the car's license plate. They check the registration and check who that is. As the group is slowly trying to track down confirmation as well as Alex, upstairs, Stella questions Corey about how wise of a decision it is to have Alex break this news. 
And while Corey gets the bad optics of it, possibly, he also thinks it's extremely compelling. Stella then gets a phone call on her personal cell, and it's from the head of YDA. He lets them know that they're standing down. This is their story to break. But he does give them some information they've gotten, and that's the hospital where they reportedly took Mitch to. Stella ends up calling Mia down in the newsroom to tell her about this information, and that's yet more information they can use to possibly get the two confirmed sources. Chip isn't able to figure out that Alex was in Italy, and it sends Chip into a bit of a panic. He's worried that she might have been in the car with Mitch. So he calls down in the newsroom to figure out if they've been able to confirm. But Joel, the producer, tells him that he's currently on the phone with the hospital they reportedly took Mitch to. And Chip screams at him to give him that hospital's information so that Chip can call as well. Chip ends up calling and getting a hold of the hospital right after Joel. And Chip starts asking if there's confirmation on Mitch Kessler. But because of the fact that Italy is at war with the coronavirus, the nurse doesn't really have a lot of time. So she's trying to rush him off the phone. She does tell Chip that they did get somebody matching Mitch's description, but he didn't have ID. Chip asked the nurse, was there a woman with him? And she says, yeah, and honestly, she wasn't doing very good. Chip then asks if it was Alex Levy, but the woman says, I don't know. But Chip at this point is absolutely fearing the worst. He ends up bursting into Corey's office, interrupting a meeting between him and Stella and telling them, I think Alex might be dead. He comes clean with the fact that he actually hasn't been talking to Alex this entire time. He just found out where she was. Stella asks him, have you talked to her family? But he says, no, I can't tell her family. Nobody knows that she's even there. I don't want to scare the crap out of him. And Corey questions, wait, how does nobody know that she's there? And that's when Chip comes clean that Alex's assistant told him. So Corey demands that they get Alex's assistant in the building right away. And as they await Alex's assistant's arrival, downstairs, Mia has to tell the crew of what's going on. She can't let the morning show continue to go on with everybody in the dark. So she tells them about the unconfirmed rumor that Mitch Kessler is dead, but also asks that they don't tell anybody because his family doesn't even know yet. She then goes back in the newsroom to try to confirm their rumors. And she ends up getting a phone call back from the person whose car was involved in the crash. He confirms with Mia that that was indeed his car. He also confirms that Mitch was staying at his Italian place. And as far as he knows, the rumors, unfortunately, are true. And that's good enough for Mia. So she has one source, but now she needs two. While the producers go off and try to get that second confirmed source, she starts typing up exactly what the anchor, whoever it is, is going to say if they're able to confirm the story. A little while later, Alex's assistant does arrive at the UBA office. She meets with Stella, and Stella guilt trips her into telling them about the flight back home. It lands in 30 minutes, so Chip takes off, trying to meet her at the airport. But as if there weren't enough chaotic things going on that day, Bradley has an issue, because Hal has shown up at the UBA offices and he is totally under the influence of something. Security tried to apprehend him, but he kept saying he was Bradley Jackson's brother, so they alerted her to the issue, and during a break, she went up and met with him. He stumbles in asking, why is everybody walking around here like it's a morgue? And she says, because there's a rumor that Mitch Kessler died, so can you keep your voice down? But he doesn't. He continues to make a scene. And when Laura Peterson comes in the room and checks on Bradley to see if she's coming back, it causes Hal to make an even bigger scene. At this point, a crowd's kind of emerged, and Hal starts smashing glasses. Laura screams for security to come in and grab him, and it's totally embarrassing for Bradley. She goes and hides in her dressing room. Laura ends up going after her and giving her a hug and telling her, you gotta go back out there, but Bradley feels like she can't. And Laura reminds her, no, you can. It'll be okay. I mean, people judging you's a bitch, but it won't kill you. And Bradley starts beating herself up over the way that she treated Hal. Laura reminds her, you're not a horrible person, but you do need to take a cold, hard look at your life. She asks Bradley, have you ever had therapy? But Bradley says, no, I'm afraid they'll tell me I'm crazy. Laura tells her, you're not crazy. You just grew up in a crazy environment. At this point, Bradley's crying and tells Laura, my family just screwed me up so much and I love them so much, but I can't fix them. So Laura tells her, maybe it's time you stepped away from them. Bradley starts defending Hal, saying that it's not his fault. And Laura tells her, I know it's not his fault, but at some point, It doesn't matter why he's the way he is. It matters that he's bringing chaos to your life. At some point, Bradley, you got to think about you. To make Bradley feel a little bit better about the situation, Laura tells her, I've had to walk away from people in my family. It's not easy. But in the end, it's just harder to deal with them. Bradley, though, can't imagine leaving Hal. And Laura says, okay, well, if he's willing to change, then put him in rehab. But honestly, I think it's a situation where you have to walk away. They then get back on set and try to finish the morning show. At this point, Chip has made his way to the airport just in enough time for Alex to step off the plane, and she's actually crying. She's not crying because of the Mitch news. She has no idea about that. She's happy because Chip was there to greet her. 
Chip then has to break the news to her. And at first, she's in complete denial because she was just with him. But he gives her all the details and also lets her know that UBA wants her to report it if they're able to confirm it. Alex then realizes she has somebody that might be able to confirm it. She gets Chip's phone and ends up calling Paula. And Paula tells Alex, you know, he cared about you so much, but the reports are true. He's dead. And Alex starts breaking down in complete disbelief. They start driving back to the UBA office together once Alex has calmed down, and Alex tells Chip that she can't go back to the office right away. They have to tell Mitch's family. And they can't call Mitch's family. This has to be a one-on-one conversation. So Chip ends up calling Mia back and has her on speakerphone, and Mia demands to know where they are, but Alex ends up speaking up. She tells Mia that the reports, unfortunately, are true, but the decision not to come back right away is hers. She needs to tell Mitch's ex before she breaks anything on the air. She promises that when they let Paige know, they'll let UBA know, and then they can go on air with it. Right after she hangs up, though, her phone starts blowing up, and it's a bunch of voicemails from Chip. Chip knows exactly what's on those voicemails, so he tries to tell her, you don't have to pay attention to that, I was just tracking you down, but she ends up listening to the latest one, it's pretty damning, and it causes a pretty big fight between the two. And they continue to fight all the way to Paige's house, but when they get there, it seems like... They've settled down a little bit. At least Alex has to. She has to tell Paige. She knocks on the door, and Paige doesn't answer. Mitch's youngest son does. Alex tells him, can you go get your mom? And when Paige comes to the door, she's a little bit surprised, but that's when Alex breaks the news. Alex asks her, do you need anything? But instead of asking for support, Paige kind of rips into Alex for sleeping with Mitch. Tells Alex, you know, I knew there were other girls, but you actually knew me. And Alex tells her it was only two times, but that doesn't make Paige feel any better. Paige kind of laughs at the comment and says, you know, you two were made for each other. I'm sorry for your loss, and then shuts the door. When she gets back in the car, she calls Mia up and tells her that she alerted Paige to the news. But then she asks Mia to put Bradley on the phone because she doesn't want to be the one to break the news. And she tells Bradley that she should be the one to actually tell the world that Mitch Kessler has died because Bradley was the one that really spurned on the change at UVA. So Bradley goes back on the air, covers the good, covers the bad, but tells the world that Mitch Kessler has died. And in episode 9, even the day after, UBA employees are still trying to process the death of Mitch Kessler. And Bradley also has the issue of her brother sitting on her couch. Her brother apologizes for what happened the previous day, making a fool of her at her office, and even agreeing to finally go to rehab. So, she's going to take off Monday, and she's going to take him down to the rehab facility. She then heads into work and gets ready to do the show. And the show is still missing Alex. And now that she's back, she has to atone for her sins. Her and her agent head into UBA to talk about her return. And that's all that Corey really cares about is when is she coming back? Because they paid a lot of money for Alex. Corey is being as supportive as he can, telling her any backlash you get, we will back you. But Alex has made up her mind. She tells him that she will be coming back Monday. But March 16th is her last day at TMS. She's giving back all of the money, which is something her agent has an issue with, but she's planning on letting him keep the commission, so, you know, that's kind of cool. But this really puts a wrench in the plans that Corey had for the morning show, but also for his network. So he asks for the room alone with Alex, trying to convince her that this isn't the right thing to do. He gives her an awesome speech about pinball, and somehow Corey actually makes it work. But the issue is, Maggie's book comes out the very next day, March 17th. And now that Alex knows what's in it, she knows she's going to be canceled. So she would rather just get ahead of this thing and fly off into the sunset before it can get really bad. She then heads down to the studio to go see Bradley, who she also hasn't seen in quite some time. She tells Bradley, I'll be back Monday. They advertised you and me, and I think we should give it to him. Bradley warns her, though, I'm not going to be in Monday. They're actually having Laura fill in, so maybe wait for Tuesday? Alex says, no, I'll be there, and I'll see you Tuesday. Bradley then asks her, maybe next week we can get a drink, because when you came back, I feel like I had all these barriers up. And Alex says, you know, I really love that, but you might want to distance yourself from me for a little bit. Bradley has no idea what she's talking about, and Alex just says, have a good weekend, and walks out. But as she's heading out, she sees Paige, Mitch's ex-wife slash widow, kind of. And Paige has come in, hat in hand, to ask the UBA employees for something. She gets ushered in by Rena, who, by the way, is the first person we see wearing a mask, and she feels pretty weird. (laughs) Those were fun days. But it's not like Paige feels comfortable. She also feels extremely uncomfortable having to do this. But they have most of the morning show staffers waiting for her, and she tells them that she knows this is a weird request, but she wants them to all come to the memorial service for Mitch. It's not like she's happy about this. She just spent the last day trying to plan a memorial service for somebody that she can't stand. But her kids asked her, Our daddy's friend's going to be there, and she didn't know what to tell him. 
So she's just coming to them as a mother, asking them to show up. Not for Mitch, but for his kids. As she's about to leave, though, she sees Alex, and she just stares at her and walks out. And Alex is frozen still in Paige's presence. We fast forward to Monday. Bradley ends up driving Hal to a bougie rehab facility. As he's walking in, Hal brings up to her about going on a trip, but she tells him, I can't. It was tough for me to get off today. And Hal starts pleading with her to just really go anywhere, something for him to look forward to. But she says, Hal, can you just stop? I love you, but I'm not going to be able to see you when you get out. She starts explaining that she's worked way too hard to get where she is and she can't move backwards. So while it's tough for her, she doesn't think it's a good idea that they continue to talk after today. And as you can probably imagine, Hal is extremely upset by this. Hal screams at her, what's the point of getting clean if my family isn't even going to be here when I get out? He then starts refusing to go inside, and Bradley tells him, I can't make you go to rehab. Hope you do. I want you to get healthy, but you're a grown adult. I've paid for this place, so figure it out. I'm leaving, and you can't come with me. They continue to bicker and argue, and Bradley pulls out a wad of cash and gives it to him and says, Do you want money? Here, here's money. Here's a few hundred bucks. And he tries to guilt trip her by saying, well, What happens if I buy drugs with this and then I OD, and then you'll never see me again? And that's the final straw for Bradley, who says, Stop it. This is your life. Go in. Don't go in. But at the end of the day, this is your life. Figure out what you want to do with it. Bradley would much rather be at the morning show, which is where Alex returns. As she's walking in, Mia lets her know that just as a precaution because of the whole coronavirus thing, they're planning on putting studios in Anchor's houses, just in case. And since Alex isn't planning on being there past March 16th, she tries to hint at her, yeah, I don't think that's really necessary, but she gets out of the conversation once she sees Chip. And she didn't expect him to see him because she hadn't heard from him. And he says, yeah, how does that feel, by the way? He realized that might have been a little hard, so he tells her, I'm going to stick around until you find somebody new to produce you or until you get canceled, whatever happens first. And then he just walks off. Seconds later, Laura walks up to her and says, hey, Alex, I just want to make sure before we go out there, we're professionals, right? And Alex says, yeah, of course. And once the camera rolls, the two of them are great. I mean, they genuinely have really good chemistry to the point where after the show, Alex goes and visits Laura in her dressing room because she wants to know why Laura hates her so much. She felt like they were friends, and then all of a sudden, they weren't. And Laura tells her her side of things, about how Alex wanted to be with her when she was famous and popular, but all of a sudden, one day, she wasn't, and Alex wanted nothing to do with her. And while she doesn't come right out and say it, she does hint about the fact that Alex was the one who leaked the information about her being a lesbian to the press. And Alex admits that she did gossip, but her tails it by saying everybody was gossiping back then. Alex says to her, I wish we had straightened that out back then. And Laura asks her, what would you have said if I asked you back then if you were gossiping? And Alex admits, probably would have denied it. Alex then gets ready to leave and tells her, I really enjoyed the show today, and it would have been fun to be friends all these years. I'm really sorry I screwed that up. And Laura, to make her feel better, says, I said shit about you too, so it happens. Alex goes home and checks out UBA+. Plus. In particular, the new Peeler Bullard interview show. And the first guest is Corey Ellison. And they cover the Maggie Brenner book. And Corey actually invites Maggie on the air anytime she wants. Come on over to UBA and talk to us. And Maggie ends up accepting it. As soon as he gets off the Peter Bullard show, Corey ends up calling Bradley and asking her to be the one to interview Maggie. And it's because she's the one that's farthest removed from the thing. She doesn't have a dog in the fight. Bradley says sure. And in order to get her fully prepared for the interview, the publishing company is going to allow her to read the book early. The next day, she heads to the publishing company and reads it page for page, and it is pretty scathing. It's a bad look for Alex. A lot of it Bradley didn't know, and it fully prepares her to interview Maggie. But while Bradley is nose deep in a book, that is also the day that Mitch Kessler is having his memorial service. One person who was planning on going was Yanko Flores, who the previous night ended up running into Claire on the street. They decided to reconnect. And they were having a blast. She asks him about hanging out, but he says, oh, I can't that day. And he's trying to avoid telling her that he was planning on going to the memorial service, but she ends up pulling it out of him. And when she finds out that Yanko is going to support Mitch, she ends up freaking out at him because she feels like Mitch was the reason why her friend died. And Mitch is one of the main reasons why she got out of the business. She tells Yanko, I'm glad he's dead, and I hope that Fred Micklin is next, him and all of his money that he got. 
She also ends up revealing to Yanko that she is helping Hannah's dad sue the company, which is something that Yanko didn't know. Yanko wanted to try to explain to her, though, why he was going, but he doesn't get the chance. She just walks off. So Yanko's definitely headed there, but one person who is torn with going is Alex. She doesn't think it's her place, but she also wants to go because she does feel like it's her place. And while she ponders it, the memorial service starts out, and it's really awkward. People are trying to avoid the elephant in the room, but one person who is not avoiding it is Dick Lundy. He gets up there, and he's a little buzzed, but he completely rips into cancel culture. A little while after the speeches, Alex does end up walking into the room. The first person she sees is Fred, but she just kind of has an awkward interaction where neither of them talk. And that's when she sees a friendly face, Paola. Paola is as thrilled to see Alex as Alex is to see her. She tells Paola that she promised Mitch that she would help Paola introduce her to the right people when she's ready. But Paola admits, I'm not really ready at this time. And Alex warns her, well... I'm about to be canceled, so you probably should be ready quickly before these people stop returning my phone calls. Alex then, in the middle of everybody, makes a speech. She asks Paige to just let her say what she has to say, knowing that it's going to be difficult for Paige. But she comes to the defense of Mitch. She tells the group that she was with Mitch in Italy. She was with him the day before he died. And what she saw was a man who was truly sorry. He had a wife and two beautiful kids that he didn't deserve. She then looks at Paige and just says, I'm so sorry for all of it, and leaves. She goes home and turns on UBA Plus to watch the interview with Maggie. But it doesn't go the way that she expected. It doesn't go the way that anybody expected. Bradley, having the ability to bury Alex, actually comes to her defense. Bradley paints Maggie as a bitter person who's trying to pour dirt on a grave. Everything that Maggie says, Bradley is able to spin it in a positive pro-Alex direction. Like when Maggie brings up this crazy woman knocking on her door, demanding that she take stuff out of her book, Bradley points out, So a woman came to you in need who had made a mistake years ago and asked you to take something out of your book and you decided to leave it in any way. She also paints Alex as a person who simply made a mistake and asks Maggie, let's go through the list of people that you're not proud you slept with. I mean, it is a really good look, not just for Bradley, but also for Alex. Alex is completely appreciative, and instead of being canceled, Twitter lights up with pro-Alex support. Maggie Brenner is made to look like a bitter writer trying to latch onto a cash grab. After the interview, Laura comes over to Bradley's house to hang out, and Laura's surprised at the reaction because when they first talked, Bradley said that she didn't like Alex, but Bradley tells her that she believed everything she said. She does owe her career to Alex. Laura then brings up that with all the coronavirus thing hitting New York, she's going to head to her place in Montana. She kind of just wants to lay low. She then asks Bradley to come, saying, I don't like what my woman works. And Bradley says, are you serious? And Laura says, no, I realize you have a job. But Bradley was talking about the whole, my woman, asking her, am I your woman? And Laura says, you scare me a little, but yeah. They start making out, but then Bradley gets a knock at the door, and it's the bellhop who drops off a package that was delivered earlier. When Bradley opens it up, it's all the money that she gave Hal. She asks the bellhop if the person's still there, but he says, no, it was delivered before my shift. And now Bradley is really stressed out on what's going on with her brother. The world goes to bed, though, because everybody has work the next day. But when Alex wakes up, she opens up Twitter and the world has turned on her. Instead of being pro-Alex, they're talking about leaked footage. Alex starts to freak out a little bit. And a quick search reveals that her speech at Mitch's memorial service was leaked. And it was leaked by Fred Micklin, who was looking to get revenge. He was recording her the whole time. And it's not a good look for somebody who mere hours ago had their coworker saying that what she did with Mitch was a mistake in the past. Because now you've got Alex saying that she was with Mitch just less than a week ago. It's also not a good look because she just came from a coronavirus hotspot. So she's getting ripped twofold. One, for having some sort of a relationship with Mitch, but also for putting her coworkers in danger. She's so frazzled, she ends up tripping over a shoe and knocking her head pretty good. She's found by Mitch and taken to the hospital. She wakes up, and her agent's calling her up, and she asks what happened, and her agent fills her in. But her agent also tells her, they tested you for coronavirus when you entered the hospital. Alex, you tested positive. And in the season finale, the morning show has to continue without Alex. It also continues without Bradley because she's out searching for Hal. So Daniel is the lead anchor. He does make a statement on UBA's behalf on the situation with Alex, making the comments at Mitch's memorial, but also coming back from Italy and putting her coworkers in danger. UBA vows to look into the matter. But Corey isn't really worried about Alex, who has returned home, by the way, and is feeling like crap. He's more concerned with the UBA Plus launch party. It's going to be a huge event, and it's going to include Tom Hanks. But Sybil's concerned. 
She's wearing a mask, and she wants to know how much it's going to cost to postpone. But Corey doesn't want to postpone at all. He even questions her on whether or not she wants Corey to fail. And Sybil tells him, no, but I think you will fail. And the market agrees. People are shorting this company, but I am pulling for you. And Corey then begs her, then let me get this off the ground. She then asks, is this about the streaming service or is this about you? And Corey admits they're one and the same. And that is Sybil's cue to leave. She gets up saying, I'm not risking getting sick for this crap. As Corey was in the meeting with Sybil, Stella and Mia were in a meeting, or I should say a Zoom call with HR and legal. They need to figure out what to do about Alex. And that's when Alex calls Stella to let her know that she's tested positive for COVID. And all of a sudden, the mood changes completely. Stella tells Mia to get everybody that came in contact with Alex out of the building immediately. So Mia flies down to the set to let the staff know that a member has tested positive, although it doesn't take much to figure out who it was. Even though both Alex and Bradley are missing, most of the onus is put on Alex. And the staff wants Mia to tell them who tested positive, but she can't because of confidentiality purposes. Mia, though, takes control of the meeting and tells them that for the time being, they're all to do their jobs remotely if they can do it. Stella then comes down, and as everybody's shuffling out, she pulls Daniel aside and says, you're going to anchor TMS for the next few days. And Daniel says, no, I'm not. He tells Stella that his grandfather is in a nursing home in California, and he needs to make sure that he's okay. He can't put him on a plane, so he has to drive there. Stella says, then let us help, but I need you here. Daniel, I know you felt sidelined, and that's not right. Then show us how wrong we are. And Daniel says, if you don't know by now, then you're never going to know. Stella tries to remind him that he was in China, and this could be one of the biggest news stories of their lifetime, and he's the right person in the right time to tell it. But he just rolls his eyes when she says, people need the news. He pulls up a cell phone and says, this is the news. We are the news for people that have way too much time on their hands. He starts walking out, and Stella reminds him, Daniel, you're under contract. And he chuckles and says, so everybody else gets to walk out, but I have to sit here because I'm under contract? Try this one out. I quit. And then he walks right up to Stella's face and says, and by the way, my grandfather thinks I have the it factor. And Stella can't believe that Mia told Daniel what she told her in that meeting. Mia, though, then asks Stella, have you even told Corey about what's going on with Alex? And Stella realizes, no, she hasn't. So she runs up to tell Corey, who's in a meeting with somebody about UBA+. She wants to be covert about it, so she starts writing post-it notes to him, saying that Alex has tested positive and that the company let her come back to work knowing that she was in Italy. It's a really bad look. They end up kicking the UBA plus guy out of the room so they can just talk amongst themselves, and they just can't believe that Alex Levy continues to just screw UBA over. They then start discussing what to do about the situation, making a statement, but also contact tracing. All of this is new to them. They have no idea what to do because they're not medical professionals or TV people. Stella, though, is very concerned with the fact they let her come back from Italy. And Corey says, wait, there's reasonable doubt. She came back 14 days ago. We don't know that she actually got it from Italy. She could have gotten it here. If she got it in Italy, she's an idiot. But if she got it here, she's an unlucky, grieving woman who deserves our sympathy. And grieving is one way to put it. She's not so much grieving. She feels like she's dying. She's not having trouble breathing at all, but her whole body is on fire. That night, it's so bad that she can't sleep, so she calls the one person who she knows will answer, Chip. And even though the relationship hasn't been great recently, he stays on the phone with her for most of the night. This spurns on an idea, though. He heads to UBA and runs into Corey, who's walking out of the building. And this is a big news day because the World Health Organization just announced a pandemic. Yanko Flores is manning the morning show. UBA Plus is supposed to have their launch party. It's a disaster. Not a great time for Corey to take a meeting on the street. But what Chip pitches him is letting Alex go on camera because of the fact she's dealing with COVID. Corey brings up the fact that they're trying to keep that a secret, but he says, why? It's good to get out anyway. This whole nation is grieving and they're terrified. Put Alex on camera. They know Alex. They're comfortable with Alex. And it'll become real if they see Alex struggling with it. Alex isn't going to die from this, but she could end up saving lives from it. It takes some convincing, but Corey doesn't think it's a bad idea at all. He ends up calling Stella and telling her to block off some time on UBA to put Alex on TV, struggling with COVID. Stella, though, marches into Corey's office and says, I can't do that. If we put Alex on TV with all the negative publicity that's going on, advertisers will pull. So Corey says, fine, we won't put her on UBA. We'll put her on UBA+. Plus. There's no sponsors to lose there. As far as subscribers, nobody subscribed. So I'll put on what I want to put on. It's Corey+. Plus. 
and Corey is really excited about the idea. He tells Chip, and now it's up to Chip to try to convince Alex. Chip heads over to Alex's apartment, and she yells at him, reminding him, you're an idiot, I have COVID. But that's when he tells her, Alex, it's fine, I tested positive. Immediately, Alex feels completely guilty. But Chip tells her, I, I feel fine, I might be asymptomatic. He then tries to picture the idea of going on TV to tell the world about COVID-19. She pushes back right off the bat, but Chip reminds her, you need something to focus on. We talked about this last night. This could be it. And just like with Corey, it takes a little bit of convincing, but Alex ends up coming around and agreeing to it. Back over at the office, though, Corey is ready to head out because he's got a busy day. Stock exchange, UBA Plus party, and wedged in there was supposed to be a meeting with Paola, but he canceled it. Because he had no idea who Paola was. This was just a favor for Alex. But Paola isn't the type to get canceled on. She ends up walking into the office and demanding that meeting with Corey. Corey, though, tries to explain how he doesn't have time, but she says, two minutes. I need two minutes. This is a favor to Alex Levy, and what I have to bring you is really good. So Corey reluctantly agrees to watch her stuff for two minutes. But as soon as he sees what it is, he ends up watching the whole damn thing. The whole Mitch Kessler documentary front to back. And he agrees, it is really good. He wants to put it on UBA+. But Pallas says no. I made a promise to Mitch that I wouldn't betray him. Without him, I never would have made this thing. So what I'm looking for is a job, but I'm not looking to put this out there. Corey, though, is being rushed out by his assistant. He's got to get going. So he makes one last plea to Paola to agree to put it out to the public. He says that what he saw in this documentary wasn't the monster that is being portrayed as Mitch Kessler. He saw a changed man. And maybe if they put it out there, it could dispel that myth. So Paola has Alex to thank for that meeting, and Alex is still struggling, but there's one person she wants to talk to before she goes on camera, and that's Bradley. She still hasn't thanked Bradley for being by her side in that Maggie Brenner interview. She asks Bradley, why did you do it? And Bradley says, because it's true. I mean, we're friends. We're not good friends, but we're friends nonetheless. Bradley then reveals to Alex what's going on with Hal about how he's missing, and Alex gives Bradley a talk that she probably needs to hear. Families are messed up. You know why? Because they're full of people. So if you want to cut ties with them, go ahead. But if not, own him. Just like the way you own me with my crap. She then asks Bradley, I mean, have you put a video out or something I need to retweet? I haven't been on social media for obvious reasons. And Bradley hasn't done it because she's kind of scared of the negative perception that Bradley's brother's a drug addict. But this conversation with Alex made her realize that she does need to put a video out. So she puts a video on her Instagram telling the public what's going on with Hal and trying to get any information that might be able to save him. That night, Bradley is about to head out to go do another loop around the city trying to find Hal when she gets a knock at her door, and it's Corey. Corey had seen her Instagram video, and she's surprised to see Corey because he's supposed to be at the UBA Plus party, but he gave in. He canceled. Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson were supposed to be there. They contracted COVID. He got word that the NBA was shutting down. It just wasn't good optics to have this party, no matter how much he wanted to. So while it pained him, he made the call to cancel it. But when he saw the video of Bradley, he wanted to help. So he came to her room and said, I'll do whatever you want. So the two head off to try to find Hal together. They walk through a homeless encampment, but he's nowhere to be seen. Bradley is really stressed out, and Corey asks, Laura's in Montana, right? And Bradley says, yeah, it's probably for the best. She thinks my family's crazy. And that's when Corey has to get something off his chest. You think it's going to be that Corey was the one to reveal the relationship between Laura and Bradley, but no, it's bigger than that. Corey says, I love you. He starts kind of trying to explain himself, but at the end of the day, it's, I love you. She can't really process it, though, because she gets a phone call on her tip line from a nurse at a hospital that has a patient that fits Hal's description, but he doesn't have any identification. When Bradley heads to that hospital, she's able to sneak in because it is extremely packed, and she is able to find Hal. Hal promises her, I didn't use Bradley, I just got beat up. And while Bradley is mad at Hal for doing what he did, she also is extremely relieved. Now while all that's going on, Alex Levy is on camera. The UBA Plus show starts out as a normal one. Alex is putting on a good face, but she's clearly dealing with some stuff. She does reveal during the show that Chip also contracted COVID, which prompts a phone call from his fiance. And what you end up finding out is Chip didn't contract COVID. In fact, he tested negative. He just came to the apartment because he knows it's what Alex needed. He didn't end up answering that phone call from his fiance because he's busy producing the show. And the show ends up going from the Alex that you know from the morning show to being an Alex who is tired of apologizing for who she is. She ends up doing something that you don't hear her do on TV. Cursing. Ranting about the people that are trying to cancel her. 
The whole time mixed in is different interviews and snippets of doctors talking about COVID. She signs off by saying, you've all meant a lot to me over the years, and I want to thank you for that from the bottom of my heart. So stay safe, stay sane, and I'll see you later. And that is the end of season two of The Morning Show. Thank you so much for getting this part of the recap. I appreciate it. Consider subscribing to the channel. Hit thumbs up if you liked it. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought it sucked. Let's talk about the comments section. I don't read it because people are either nitpicking, pointing out every mistake you made, or just generally it's a cesspool. So if you say something, chances are I'm probably not going to see it. Every once in a while I see a comment, and it's always the negative ones. But just know, I appreciate you all watching, even the people that need to nitpick. So at this point, I'm kind of like Alex Levy. I'm done apologizing. Watch it. Don't. I don't care. Thanks so much. See ya.